WGSO. Ladies and gentlemen, the last president of the United States of America. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. Battle of New Orleans Radio with your hosts, Nathan Lawrence, Caleb Hitt, and Gwen on 990 WGSO. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Battle of New Orleans Radio right here on 990 AM WGSO in the heart of the Crescent City, the home of the First Amendment. You will not hear this message or any of this information on any other radio station or broadcast in the New Orleans area or the Gulf South. So we appreciate WGSO for giving us this opportunity on a weekly basis I'm your host, Nathan Lawrence, and along with my terrific co-host, Mr. Goyam. Goyam. What's up, brother? Not much, man. Hanging yeah, in there. Yeah, that, that's right, man. That's, that's right. We're hanging in. You know, it's just every day, man, it's it's a, uh, it's a an information battle, information struggle. We see, you know, this this giant Category 12 hurricane. Guess, we got, yep. we got, we got, mm-hmm. we got, uh, you know, ca- uh, Hurricane Irma Thomas is just fear, barreling down on Is it fear-mongering or is it reality? I mean, maybe a little bit of both. You know, is the storm going to, I don't know, it might miss the whole mainland of Florida. We don't know. It's still it, three, four days away he, from he, from Florida. So, I mean, I, I've seen video today on some of the islands, of course. You know, you don't have much much room to run. I was going to go to the Virgin Islands next month. I don't know. Yeah, this time of year. You know. <laughs> I'm, I might not be going. But, you know, we see these storms. Look, I was watching last night the documentary called we- uh, Weaponized Weather. Uh, it, was a, by, it was about Dr. Ben Livingston, who helped, you know, weaponize the weather for the government in the 60s, 70s, and even before then. And he actually had his own cloud seeding uh, business. And he was... You know, discussing how and showing how they can, you know, dissipate these giant storms in in his in his guesstimation that a lot of times the government doesn't want to openly admit that they can do this because once they admit they can dissipate these storms and it opens up lawsuits for either not dissipating the storms or for dissipating the storms. So then it just opens up, you know, a bunch of lawyers into suing people. But the technology is there uh, by using silver iodide. They can uh, steer these storms and dissipate them and do many things. Uh, there's also the harp system, which is in two places in Alaska. One's near Anchorage. The other one, I, I believe, is around Nome. Uh, and then the third one the United States has is in uh, Arecibo, Puerto Rico. This is these ionized uh, heaters. It, it heats up the uh, ionosphere. And they're able to create giant weather systems, highs, lows, and steer them. For anybody that, that thinks this is a joke, you need to you need to look this up. And you, then see, you got the Nextrad technology. Yeah, that's the giant Doppler systems that are able to uh, control and manipulate uh, various highs and lows and weather currents. So, look, this is not this isn't a conspiracy theory. But look uh, at look, Nathan. Look at the uh, agendas that come from this. I absolutely, mean, you, you always you look could, at the agenda. Yeah, you got. FEMA now is going to get billions of dollars for this Houston recovery, so they're going to get lots of this uh, money. To- it, you know, FEMA is a military operation. Most of FEMA's budget, budget is black budget. It's military. It's not even for disasters. Yeah, so that so you start the problem, you know, create the problem, create the solution there. You got the FEMA. You got the Houston problem. Now you got FEMA coming in with lots of money, and, and everybody's going to yeah. applaud that. Like, we got to do something. And, look, there is, uh, you know, a lot of damage and, and human Ooh. sacrifice and issues that – uh, um, problems there with uh, property damage and whatnot. But then you got FEMA getting the money. Then we see in the uh, Virgin Islands now, Nathan, oh, oh, no, yeah, they t- got the gun ban going on tell right Tell everybody now. with the governor and the commander-in-chief, they're more like the commander-in-thief, tell them what he's doing. And I'm not talking about Trump. I'm talking about the governor they're there. Doing, they're doing a gun confiscation in, in advance of the storm over there hey, in Puerto hey, Rico. Hey, go ahead. I mean, during the break, post that letter that you sent me. Post that on our on our Facebook page so the okay. listeners can see that. You know, yeah, this is they, a direct order 
They turn in all your guns. I mean, we you saw that. We saw Islands. that. We saw that in with Katrina here, uptown New Orleans. Certain parts of the neighbor uh, of New Orleans were being uh, thirteen hundred weapons. They got thirteen. That was yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that down here. But they had foreign uh, troops in New Orleans yeah, taking indoors. Okay, so we got the agendas. We got number one. FEMA gets a lot of money coming down the pipe. Okay, number two from these. If you want to go with the conspiracy that this is controlled weather modified storms, and it we could be, it could not be, but they have the technology to do it. Either way, the agenda is being pushed through. They got the gun ban in Puerto Rico. That happened this week, guys. Open no, your yeah, eyes. The Virgin Islands. Okay. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. Sorry. Virgin Islands. NOLA.com. Yeah. Check it NOLA. out. NOLA.com is even promoting that. Okay. Then you have the FEMA money in the billions. They got this uh, bankroll there. You got the global warming, global carbon tax push ah. because now, now everyone's going to be. You saw what happened to Houston. You saw what happened to global Miami. Global warming, global warming. Even they even, canceled a football game. Well, check this out. Even though there's there's earthquakes, not excuse me, not earthquakes. There's volcanoes that shoot out gas that emit more carbon dioxide. One little burp than uh, we all have used in our human his history. One time. <laughs> But, you know, they can't tax that, but they can tax your vehicle. And now we see, and like we reported a few weeks back, we had inside information from our good buddy, I'm not going to say who, that they were going to start taxing, dealing with the floodwaters. Now, a week ago, Mitch Landrieu announced they're going to start uh, bringing in, I, I'll have to pull up the specifics on it, they're going to start taxing on various waters uh, that are being, you know, caught for the flooding here in New Orleans. Well, they so that's another, more Agenda 21 taxes. Yep. They, had, they had another fire today at the yeah. Sewage and Water. Man, it's every day. I've seen one another day by my house. <laughs> but look, before we before we, we go to our, our guest this next segment, let's go ahead and take this call. So he, he's he got a question for us. Our buddy Sid from Gentilly. We really appreciate uh, Sid listening and calling in, Sid. So look, go ahead uh, with your question or comment, brother. Well, my comment first is that y'all are going to be on every week, not every which hours, because uh, I can buy into a lot of what y'all are saying about control and weather. I really believe our government is doing it, maybe on the verge of doing it, but, yeah. but I, I really believe that I can buy into what y'all are saying. What are your hours and when would y'all hey, be on? Hey, see, we're going into our third year, and we're, uh, we're on Wednesday nights from 7 to 9, and if you want to hear the truth, the unadulterated truth, not this red, red uh, blue, well, it's left, all right Landry's garbage. Fault. Yeah, so it's just all Trump. Trump did that. It, it, look, there's stuff behind the scenes. You got to realize, and that's what we're about. You know, it, you know, Sid, Sid, in 1967 to 1974, uh, in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, Doctor Ben Livingston ran a project called Project uh, Operation Storm Fury, where they flooded the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, and actually killed a lot of Vietnamese for for the Vietnam War. Um, so this is on record. Uh, you can look this up. Uh, I mean, the, the, he he ran more than 260 uh, operations by flying uh, into the eyes of hurricanes and actually dissipating and, and moving and controlling st uh, storms with just a little small amounts of silver iodide. So the technology and capability is there. Go ahead. I, I, I can definitely buy into that. My, my question uh, is kind of confusing to me. Because uh, I, 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 I'll be as fast as I can. I know Go ahead. You, because uh, Katrina, I had to leave my home, and I lost my home for Katrina. Okay. So I'm, I'm at the Park Esplanade apartment now since uh, 2006. Okay. So when I left for Katrina, me and my sister, we went with another couple. We had no hotel rooms or nothing like that. But we just drove out the city. Instead of having much, we went northeast. We took that, uh, what's that, 65 or 60, I-69. We, we had the concert flow in the Mississippi, drove to Hattiesburg, uh, Macomb, Merid not Macomb, Meridian and that. And we wound up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So so we we, 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 we gave them our credit cards and that for the room. We got the last two rooms. Well, anyway, make a long story short, FEMA kicked in, and me and my sister was there for eight months. And FEMA paid for the rooms, and we had to get out. We had to get out because the people were having a big wedding in the hotel. We were okay, we got 30 out. seconds till the break. So you could either, Sid, you could either hold on and, and finish your question, or uh, let, let, look, Sid, hold that thought. We're coming to break in 20 seconds. It's a commercial break we have to take. So, look, we'll be right back, and we want to hear the rest of your question yep. there, Sid. So stand by. Battle of Radio. We'll be right back. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Battle of New Orleans Radio right here in the home of the First Amendment. Look, we're going to bring Sid back on to finish his point, And then we're going to bring on our terrific guest, author, researcher, uh, student of history, Mr. James Perloff. Uh, we're going to be discussing 9-11 and, you know, just the state of the world and some new, you know, some new things he's uh, discovering about 9-11. So, look, I want to let uh, Mr. Sid from Gentilly finish his point. Uh, you know, about these storms and about FEMA. So go ahead, Sid. We on the air? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Sid. Finish your point, brother. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll be as fast as I can. So go ahead. Like I said, Katrina, Katrina FEMA kicked in and paid for me and my sister's hotel room for eight months. Now, in 2008, for Gustav, I was on the other side of the fence. I wound, in, wound up in the shelter in Birmingham, Alabama, and I had to fake a heart attack the first night. Because ten of them were getting ready to get, getting ready to do me, and I knew they were gonna wind me up as soon as I went to sleep. The first thing they were steal was my wallet. They had ten of them winding me up. I didn't stand a chance where I was at. You had a fake I a heart attack, a, huh? I, I faked a heart attack. I wound up in the Birmingham hospital. The Labor Day was that Monday. Tuesday they discharged me. They said, "Where well, do you want to go? Back to the shelter?" I, they gave me a cab. I just had no car. They said, where well, do you want to go? Back to the shelter? I said, no, bring me to Birmingham Airport. So I slept in the Birmingham Airport Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Took a first flight out to New Orleans that Friday. Now, what I'm, the point I'm trying to get across, I heard on TV about that the hurricane in Houston. I heard that FEMA kicked in, and they paying for hotel rooms for the, for, for the people in Houston. Now, I was watching Florida, and the Florida governor said that there's a phone number you can call if you want to get a ho if you want to get a hotel room rather than a shelter. Well, anybody with common sense, I was on both sides of the fence. I'd rather stay in a hotel than a shelter. That's why I'm not going to evacuate for no storm unless I can get a hotel room because I'm not going in a shelter and get killed. I'd rather let the storm kill me. So I want to know. What phone number can I call? How can I make hotel arrangements for any storm that comes my way in the wild? Because I, I, I'd rather FEMA kick in and pay for my hotel room again than go in a shelter. I'm really confused. It, it, yeah, the, the, I'm not. I don't have those answers for you, Sid. But you know what? I will. I will look into it for you. And look, if you ever get your pen and a pad, I'm gonna give my phone number to you right now on air. If you ever want to talk. If you ever want to get a cup of coffee and discuss any of these things, look. Personal cell phone number. Yeah, call me up. I know everybody's already got it. I know the uh, New World Order uh, whores they here in exactly New Orleans, they, they already have me. So <laughs> I'm going to tell you anyway. It's 985-640-8822, Sid. Call me. Let's talk about this. 985-640-8822. Walter Isaacson already has his little goons and minions uh, all over the city anyway. So. Go, go, go ahead, Sid. Look, hit me up, call me, and I'll try to have some answers for you tomorrow on this. So, you know, I don't have any right offhand, though. Look, but if, you, I'm if, you, with, if you choose to live down here on the coast, you know, the weaponized uh, weather, you see three storms are out there right now. They're trying to ramp this up. They're pushing this global carbon tax. They're pushing this FEMA, uh, you know, these this big money to FEMA and, you know, all these storms. Sustainable uh, development. Look, sustainable look, development. Look what they're going to do after all this happens. Yeah, they're going to the, push that Agenda 21 stuff even more. The they'll, gent there. they'll gentrify the cities. They'll move in the uh, ISIS northeast uh, destabilization force coming from New the, York. The local whites and blacks here get pushed out, yeah. priced out, pushed out, yeah. relocated. You know, and as far as what you're talking about, Sid, I mean, look, you're talking about free market here. Hotels, you got to be you got to be ahead of the curve, man. Don't get yeah. stuck in the contra flow. Yeah. Keep your keep your tank full, dude. Don't you know? Just because the projections right now are saying I uh, Irma's going to go to Florida this and that, it's still three days away. You you still got to keep an eye out. Yeah. I mean, you you do. I mean, you don't have to be paranoid about it, but you got to be prepared. Uh, and if you choose to live down here, you know, otherwise, you know, maybe move to Des Moines, Iowa. But even there, you're going to deal you with might, You might flood. Yeah, tornadoes, floods. So, look, it's just the way the world is. That's life. And uh, I'm sorry to hear that. And, and you know, it, it is what it is right now. So call, call me up, though, Sid. Let's get together. Look, we have a well, – what's up, Sid? Go ahead. 985-640-8222. 88-22. Two, two. Look, if you ever need a ride, need to go somewhere, man, look, call me up. I'll come grab a cup of coffee. We'll go eat a sandwich or something, man. Call me up. We'll uh, we'll shoot the bull, man. 985-640-8822. Two, two. 
If you're listening to Walter Isaacson, hello. Please, yeah, please don't, uh, please don't hire back, Sid to back. take out Nathan there. That'd be yeah, thirty uh, coins of silver there, like Jesus. Yeah, look, bring him in there. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Appreciate All right, Sid. it, Sid. Look, I, I want to bring on this next guest. He's one of my favorites. Um, I really enjoy talking with him. You know, he's really he's done a lot for the truth movement. He's been in this battle a long time for several decades now. We're going to bring on Mr. Uh, James Perloff. He's author, researcher. He's uh, used to write for The New American. Um, he's written, you know, several books, Truth is a Lonely Warrior, Shadows of Power, uh, several others. And I wanted to bring James on to discuss, you know, 9-11 because here we are. Was it September 6th? Mm-hmm. We're, close to that. We're, we're encroaching. They're both the, about to push that agenda hard. Yeah, we're in, it's the terrorists did all that. We're encroaching the 9-11 uh, anniversary, so I thought it would be very relevant to bring uh, Mr. Perloff on to discuss, you know, any uh, future knowledge or, or any new, uh, you know, information or new theories that may be floating out there. So, so James, welcome to the broadcast, man. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me on, guys. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, we've talked about the Confederate monuments before and stuff like that, and. Tonight we'll get into 9-11 with that anniversary approaching. Well, actually, you're speaking of that, James, really quickly. want to give our listeners a quick anecdote about that. We had uh, Dr. Marksbury over there at the uh, Burgar Monument today, and he was trying, or where it used to be, and he's, I think he's, he's trying to push a lawsuit against the city now or City Park or whatever, and they had a, a press conference, but the local media didn't really cover it. Um, you know, uh, yeah, the monuments and whatnot and all the protests and the divide and conquer and all this that's happening now is ramping up and we're seeing it they took one down in dallas uh, i think sh- they just charlotte that. virginia they're taking another one down yeah and i mean again you know we we talked a little bit about the Char- charlottesville the more divide and conquer you know and, and now we got the football distraction coming now and man they got us really riled up and they got us uh they're blitzing us on every level like football you know whether it be with the weather or the statues or the divide and conquer and now they got us distracted with the sports now yeah. We got football coming up. People on social media, oh, fantasy football. I mean, these people, I kid you not, James, I saw people uh, Sunday night. These are people in Louisiana that love the Saints, okay? Truth be told. They were screaming and hollering on social media. I know I'm going off on a tangent. They're screaming and hollering between each other over UCLA and Texas A&M, some great comeback. Like, oh, my God, are you watching this? Are you seeing what happens? These people are so riled up about some team that has nothing to do with their family or their bills or them being stuck in the debt matrix or their country or all the agendas that are being pushed on us, like Agenda 21. And yet they're going to fight on social media for three hours, comment after comment about who's better, who did what, who should onside kick what. (laughs) And I kid you not, watch this football distraction kick in. Of course, you know. You know, we're going to see a lot of division with the whole national anthem thing. And I don't care one way or another, but I just know that this is an agenda against the people to divide us more. You know, and this is just something you're going to see more with the NFL. And it's just an agenda being weaponized against us of all backgrounds of all, you know, because we're so, you know, we all want to be numb by the sports distraction. But anyways, James, I just, you know, we had that situation. Dr. Marksbury was in New Orleans today, a press conference that didn't get much press about one of the four monuments that got taken down. And um, if he is listening, I hope he can call in. I know he sometimes listens to the show. So maybe we'll try to get a hold of him for next week and find out. Um, I think we got maybe about two minutes left yeah. before the break. But, James, go ahead really quick. Give us about a – well, actually, one minute. Give us a quick rundown of what's going on, and um, and then we're going to go to the break there. Go ahead. Well, so let me just use that minute to follow up uh, what you're saying. You know, that idea of distracting people with sports goes back more than 100 years. You know, the protocols of uh, Zion – I don't have the quote in front of me, but I could get it. But it, it talks about distracting people with the arts and sport uh, over 100 years ago. And, you know, that's published in Russia in 1903. And, of course, that was the year of the first World Series. They just revived the Olympics. And, uh, you know, the sports season never ends. They keep adding more and more teams. I mean, there used to be six NHL teams, the Hockey League. Right now they got over 30, I think. And they just keep uh, making more and more of it sports talk. It's just insanity. But you're absolutely right. Uh, they want people to have their minds off the issues, the real issues that count, and get them ramped up against hey, the false. Hold, hold that thought, James. We're going to break. Hold that yeah. thought. Yeah, they want us to be a bunch of non, uh, numbless, mindless uh, drones out there. They can really control us and manipulate us. Battle New Orleans. We'll be right back.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Battle New Orleans Radio. And that was our buddy Payday Monsanto under control there, talking about the 2.3 train that, that vanished uh, the day before by Mr. Dove Zakim, uh, who was the Pentagon comptroller. And we're five days away from September 11th. We're going to get a lot of that media <laughs> propaganda talking about how, you know, Afghanistan and. You know, uh, that's where the root of problems are. Red, white, and blue. Wrap yourself in yeah, a flag. Yeah. Apple Osama, pie. Osama bin Laden. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're, we got this ramp up from Trump trying to send yeah. more troops over there. Yeah, well, and you look. That's going to tie into what we're about to get. You know? I'm going I'm to say this, and then I'm going to open the floor to James and let, let him go with, with what he wants to talk about. Is that, you know, we have to take out Kim Jong-un now, even though if I was North Korea... I would want nuclear weapons as well because every nation that has given up their weapons, the dictator or president gets slaughtered in the street, Gaddafi, Saddam, um, all of this. So, you know, we've been the aggressor in this. And then the, the lying, fake stream, you know, phony media says that they're being the aggressor. But, but who I, I haven't seen North Korean subs in the Gulf. I haven't seen North Korean ships off the coast of uh, New York. But we have our ships over there. What North Korea does is none of our business. It's none of our business. So we need to quit acting like the world's police and just leave it alone. So go ahead, James. The floor is yours, man. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, you're absolutely right. And uh, we've had false flag after false flag after deception that's been bringing us into wars and turning us into uh, World Police Force, and the, the first one that really did that was uh, Spanish-American War after the main sank, and we went. We were told we had to go down to fight for freedom and democracy in Cuba when they were actually after the sugar industry down there. You know, it's been going on ever since, and we won't go over that that uh, that whole history. But I wanted to focus in on 9/11. Yes, sir. With the anniversary coming up, and I've written two uh, my mo most two recent blog posts on my website jamesperloff.com. Uh, one is called 9/11 Simplified which is uh, an effort to uh, draw closer towards an accurate reconstruction of the events. And then after that, you know, I heard from six different pilots, none of whom uh, believe the official 9-11 story. Two of them were scheduled to fly in 9-11, uh, but one of them is an active uh, pilot uh, for a major airline. He flies an Airbus 300. That's the, the, you know, the European equivalent of um, a 767, and he's a, a, you know, a British-born pilot. He had so many insights, and he, he taught uh, pilots, airline pilots, for years how to fly. And he had so many insights into flight. And um, I, so I asked him a ton of questions about 9-11, and he was able to clear up a few of the, um, some of the myths that have come into that, um, even within the truth movement. But uh, what I want to talk about tonight, and I don't know if, how much we can pack into the time I've got, but um, I want to talk about the who of 9-11, and I want to talk about the how. And I know that some people say, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of all the debate about the how. I just want to the, the know the who and how these people are brought to justice. But, you know, if you're a prosecutor in a courtroom, uh, you can't just talk about the who. you got to tell how the guy did it. And by the same token, if you're a prosecutor talking to a jury, you can't just talk about how the crime was done. you got to talk about who did it, who your suspect is. And so we want to talk about both. Um, and so let's start by talking about the who. And... Um, uh, what I mentioned at the outset of my article, 9-11 Simplified, was that I think that we have a little meme that got introduced into the truth movement. And I, I think your song actually just touched on this. And I think the meme, which is a little misleading, is uh, the one that says 9-11 was an inside job. And I, I think it's more accurate to say that 9-11 was actually an outside job by Israeli operatives, but done certainly with the consent and cooperation at the highest levels of our government. 
Dick Cheney on down or Bush on down. And a perfect analogy for this, by the way, is the attack on the USS Liberty. Now, it's certainly true that Secretary of Defense McNamara and President Johnson were very cooperative with that scenario and even recalled fighters twice that have been sent from the Sixth Fleet to rescue the Liberty. But on the hands-on operational level, it wasn't the U.S. Air Force attacking the Liberty, it was the Israelis. And I think that 9-11 becomes a lot clearer in how it's carried out when we focus on that. And so uh, uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to start talking about some of the uh, well, James, li- listen to our, our listeners. A lot of listeners do not know anything about the USS Liberty. So, I mean, like a qu- quick, like Cliff Notes, uh, you know, like USS Liberty for dummies. Give us a quick, quick, like to the listeners, because uh, we're aware, but tell that to what exactly happened. Okay. During the Six Day War of 1967, the USS Liberty, a, a communications and intelligence ship, was off the Egyptian coast. Now, the Israelis attacked it in unmarked planes. This is so it could be blamed on the uh, Egyptian, uh, the Egyptians. They uh, they passed over many times. They knew it was American. It was, you know, had a clear uh, American flag flying and uh, English markings, not Arabic markings. But they attacked it, and uh, they they uh, strafed it, they napalmed it, they machine gunned the lifeboats, and then they sent in the torpedo boats. They fired five torpedoes, one of which hit the Liberty, and they killed 34 U.S. sailors and wounded more than 170. And uh, then there was a, a, um, a complete cover-up of that incident. Uh, this is during the Six-Day War, uh, and Israel wanted to bring us into the war on their side by blaming this on the Egyptians. And their orders, and we know this from the, air, from the uh, air, uh, ground-to-air communications, that, that they knew it was an American ship, and the orders were to sink the U.S. Liberty with no trace left. But, but fortunately, some of the guys patched together some of the uh, shot-up communications equipment, got off a message to the Sixth Fleet. And um, so the Liberty was spared, but many died that day. Uh, but there was a complete cover-up. And uh, actually, uh, it was John McCain's father in the Navy, who, or, who I'm sure under orders from the White House, gave an order that the Court of Inquiry was only to last one week, when in fact they, they uh, figured they needed at least six months to gather the evidence. But that has been suppressed for a long time. That was a false flag that failed. Um, but uh, according to Bryce Lockwood, who's a Liberty survivor, he said that that attack opened the door to 9-11 because when the Israelis attacked us and murdered our, our, our sailors and got away with it, you know, the next year we tripled military aid to Israel, believe it or not. Uh, when they did that, they knew that they could attack Americans with impunity. And because of their control, their, you know, the apex control of the U.S. government, they would never face any consequences. That, real, that, real, that incident in 67, that's 50 years ago now, really opened the door to tonight's topic, which is 9-11. All right. Well, yeah, that was a great explanation there, and uh, a lot of our listeners are not aware of that. That's not something you hear in the mainstream media at all, and it's it's right. our listeners need to go research that and uh, you know see for themselves the truth on that. So, I mean, you know, you see this ramp up, but Trump is wants to send more troops mm-hmm. to uh, Afghanistan. You know, September 11th coming. What do you see happening there? And oh, well, go, uh, go ahead, continue. He's uh he's going against his um his uh, campaign. Uh, rhetoric when he said we should get out of Afghanistan, and as, as he did when he sent those 59 Tomahawk missiles to bomb Syria, when he told um, Obama in his tweets to stay out of Syria, stay home and uh, fix America. Some people think that the, uh, you know, we've been in Afghanistan for 16 years now, and the, the idea of extending, that's like four times longer than our involvement in World War II. And uh, the idea that you want to extend this war now, sending more troops is not going to win it. That's what he's claiming, that we could win it if we send more troops. But some people do feel that the real reason for those troops is uh, to give um, an entree into a bigger role in Syria, where ISIS and our, our, you know, our backed ISIS fighters are now losing big time, and that they've got some new false flag perhaps in the future, and they want to increase the role of the United States in that, on that battlefield. Yeah, yeah, we didn't mean to get you off in the weeds, James. Go ahead with, with you know, your article uh, in discussing uh, 9-11 there. Right. Well, oh, like I said, we want to do the who. And uh, in speaking of Israel, the, the best article I've ever seen that validates uh, Israel's involvement com- comprehensively and it's well written, it's the Wikispooks post called 9-11 Israel Did It. But let's just take a little sampling. Uh, of course, you've got the dancing Israelis. Uh, all right, hold, hold, hold that thought, James. I mean, these breaks are happening quick. When we come back, okay. we're going to break. When we come back, we're going we're gonna to come right back to the dancing Israelis. We're not going to uh, get you sidetracked. Look, ladies and gentlemen, 
This is Battle of New Orleans Radio. Whatever the real story of 9-11 is, the government lied. Are you really going to believe Henry Kissinger in his fake-ass report, in his fake 9-11 commission report? I mean, give me a break. I mean, Henry Kissinger is Mr. New World Order, and this is the same guy that uh, has been talking to Trump. Uh, in various times. So look, Battle of New Orleans Radio, Mr. James Perloff. Go check him out, jamesperloff.com. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Battle of New Orleans Radio. I guess Mr. James Perloff, man, we're talking about 9-11. We're coming on to, we're coming into the, you know, the uh, anniversary. This will be the 16th anniversary of this uh, inside-outside job, you know, uh, perpetrated by forces that run our government, which isn't our government. We, we don't have a government. We're run by international interests, um, banking interests, military industrial complex interests, uh, you name it. So that's who runs us. And they worked with the Mossad and the Saudis to, you know, and perpetrate our, all our this. CIA. Yeah. Well, yeah, they all worked together, CIA, all of that. So, James, you were just discussing the dancing Israelis. Go ahead. Hey, James, you there? Sorry about that. I had my mute uh, on. Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, well, I was starting to talk about uh, Israeli involvement, and of course, uh, among the most famous is the dance in Israelis. They were uh, caught filming the event and celebrating and high fiving each other. And of course, they were allowed to go home uh, to Israel after a couple of months, and that was thanks to Michael Chertoff being placed in the uh, Justice Department in charge of the uh, investigation of 9 11. Hey, James, yeah. James, not yeah. to cut you up, but you know, the dancing Israelis, they were all working for urban moving systems and on some of their on one of their vans, you know, they found explosives in their vans, they found, you know, Palestinian outfits, and in one of their vans they actually had a mural. We've had Wayne Matson on here to talk about this. They had a mural on the side of the urban moving systems van that actually showed nine eleven happening, like a plane crashing into the twin towers, you know, on the side of their van. And that was a Mossad front. Go ahead. Right in uh, my uh, my blog post, I've got uh, that clip of the uh, uh, New York PD uh, transmissions about that uh, mural van. It, it, it was for real, and there were also uh, eyewitnesses on that clip too. Um, well, uh, okay, so you've got a lot of Israelis uh, in, in New York City at that time. Uh, Michael Chertoff was, uh, was put in charge of the investigation of 9/11. His mother was a Mossad agent, so it's not surprising he sent all the Israelis back home. And then, of course, uh, airport security was um, owned by uh, Israelis. Uh, there was ICTS uh, International at all the airports where those planes left. Uh, it was owned by uh, Ezra Harrell and Menachem Atsum, Israelis. Uh, World Trade Center security was in uh, the hands of Kroll Associates, uh, Jeremy and Jules Kroll being um, heavy-duty Zionists linked to Israel. Of course, you've got uh, Lucky Larry Silverstein. Lucky who, Larry. Uh, yeah, he he got control of the World Trade Center less than two months before the event. He invested 124 million, got an insurance payout of almost five billion. Wow! And uh, of course, he managed to avoid being at the World Trade Center on the morning of the attack due to a fortuitous yeah. doctor's appointment. But what a lot of people don't know is he was such good friends with Netanyahu that Netanyahu would call him every Sunday uh, in the days leading up to 9/11, and that's according to the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, and you'll find the citation for that hey, in my articles. Hey James, you know he also said on that in an interview clip, yeah, we had the building number seven, we had the pullet. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's uh, one more uh, you know uh, nail in the uh, evidence coffin because um, you've got Zim Navigational, the world's ninth largest um, um, uh, navigation uh, company, um, which uh, was in the World Trade Center. Uh, for decades, and then one week before 9/11, they decided to pull out, uh, move mm. to another uh, location. Uh, you know, P Tech, which is uh, uh, linked to the Mossad, which was producing vital software used by the FAA, the you know Federal Aviation, uh, and the FBI and U.S. Armed Forces on 9/11. Uh, you've got Philip Zelikow in charge of the 9/11 Commission. He's a dual Israeli citizen. Why would you want someone with sworn loyalty to a foreign country? being charged with a 9-11 investigation. But, you know, of course, you mentioned uh, Zach Heim, you know, Wolfowitz and Pinak calling for the new Pearl Harbor. But the one who really gets me is um, Danny Lewin. Now, Danny Lewin was a former captain in the IDF, uh, Israeli Defense Force, and he served in Sayeret Matkal. That is their special ops. And um, if we, I, I hope we have time for it tonight. I, 
I believe these guys played a huge role on 9-11, which is something your listeners won't have heard before. But he was a guy who could kill you with his bare hands or a credit card, according to the mainstream media. And uh, in the year 2000, you'll see these pictures on my, my website, uh, these articles. But um, the year before 9-11, he had himself an official portrait taken in front of two panels that looked like the Twin Towers. Now, if, as you close in on his picture, his thumb is pointing to his watch. And his watch was a Swatch Hijacker model watch. That was the name of the watch, a hijacker. And the second hand, minute hand, hour hand, and date were all set to the 11, even though the picture wasn't taken on the 11th. Now, the chances of them all being on the uh, 11 by chance, it's over 20,000 to 1 when you do the math. 20,000 and was, one, huh? Yeah. Where was Danny Lewin on 9-11? He was in row 9 of flight 11. And um, that's just a sampling of the evidence you'll, you'll find in that Wiki Spooks article I mentioned called uh, 9-11 Israel Did It. And our listeners, how can our listeners see that, James? James, uh, how, how can our listeners see that again? Uh, on your uh, By going to my post, 9-11 Simplified, it's right at the early part of the post. They can yeah. see the, the four photographs, including the, the ad from Swatch Watch with its hijacker model watch that he's wearing. Yeah, it's, it's on jamesperloff.com. You can find it. Wow. Great article. Yeah. Okay, so the last thing I want to say about Israel is that if you're a police detective and you're solving a crime, you know, one of the first questions you ask, you're looking for motive, you say who benefited, right? You know, did somebody get insurance from this murder, et cetera, right? Who benefited from 9-11? Did the American people benefit? No. We've been fighting, spending trillions of dollars and losing thousands of lives in these unnecessary wars. And we've got a police state. Did the Muslims benefit? No. The uh, uh, Islam in the Middle East has been turned into chaos with Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, now bombing Syria. It's in chaos, man. The only beneficiary is Israel. They've sat back and watched us knock off their enemies one by one in fulfillment what they call the Yinon plan or the Greater Israel plan. If people want to read about that, I would go to um, the article called uh, Greater Israel Project on uh, Global Research. That is the best summary I've seen of that. Yeah, but they're a great that, website. That kind of summarizes Israel's involvement for me. Yeah. Hey, James, James, before you go any further, for, for all the listeners out there that have really bought into, you know, that are Christian Zionists, can you, you know, can you dispel, because, you know, I, we were called anti-Semitic a couple of weeks ago for pointing this out. Can you dispel anybody that will call up and say, oh, you're an anti-Semite? And, James, listen, I have something else to add to that. This is Goyam, you know, and we got about a minute and a half, so we want to get your full response on this maybe after the break. You know, we listen to the radio in New, in America, New Orleans, and we got a call coming in now, 504-556-9696, if you want to talk to James. But we listen to talk radio, or we listen to the mass media, uh, newspapers and whatnot, and people will say or call in the radio, talk radio, and they'll say stuff like, quote, unquote, you know, Muslims are the root of all of our problems, and, and Islam is... Is is the the biggest issue, and we gotta we gotta extinguish it, we gotta exterminate it, we gotta terminate it. And if you replace that with anything else, namely like say something like this, like Israel or uh, stuff like that, Judaism, whatnot, there is a major backlash. Yet there's a double standard. People will never stop, you know, people from saying things and bashing on Muslim people or bashing on. Uh, you know, Islam or Christians or whatever, you know, they'll bag on almost every other group. I mean, they could bag on uh, black people, white Christians, uh, Muslims. That's fine. And we're going to get after this break. I want to hear your response. But I kid you not. I hear all the time. No one ever gets hung up on. No one ever gets muted. No one. No radio shows ever get shut down. When people say all the time on the air, Muslims are the root of all of our problems. They say it on social media. You bring up Zionist yeah. or the J word. Yeah, I mean, you can it, forget about it. And yeah, and so I mean, the double standard. So anybody listening who's trying to report us or try it, to it, mark it, notes down, you got to look in the mirror. I mean, you're it, you you're not writing anything down about this uh, atrocity there, where people are allowed to just say vile things about the Muslim community. Uh, you know, these people are being played like a pawn for this Kalargi plan, this worldwide relocation plan. So, anyways, look, we're coming to the break. We want to get Mr. Perlos' full response to that. And we also have a call we're going to get to after the break. And if anyone else wants to call and talk to Mr. Perloff live on Ballad New Orleans Radio, call us up, 504-556-9696, and you can talk to him live. Go ahead, Nathan. You want to finish out the break? No, no, that, that, that's it, man. Uh, great show, man. And, and we want to hear your response, James, and then we're going to take a call or two, and uh, we'll be right back. Ballad New Orleans Radio.
the bugles ring. We stood beside our cotton spills and didn't say a thing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Battle of New Orleans Radio. Mr. James Perloff. Go check out his beautiful article at jamesperloff.com. We wanted to get his response on, uh, you know, the double standard there where, you know, we've been persecuted for this on the air, and we want to stand up for the Muslim community there and, and, and hold people the the – the usurpers accountable and the people coming after us accountable and, and for the listeners to know that there is a double standard yeah. because you can call up a show in new orleans or nationally and say those things bad bad mouth muslims and no one says a peep it's okay no one gets any reprimand for that so mr perloff what's your take on that well you're 100 uh, percent on the money uh, you guys know what the score is and uh, regarding anti-semitism i am half jewish myself um, well, there our you go. name was Perlovsky um, back in, in Russia. Uh, my uh, uh, father's uh, parents were uh, were uh, Russian Jews who immigrated to this country in 1905, uh, the time one of the pogroms. And uh, but we're talking about here is that you're right. There's a double standard. You just take take a look at um, um, uh, that you cannot criticize, for example, um, anything about the Holocaust. Uh, you know, Ursula Haverbach is an 87-year-old woman who said to her knowledge that uh, Auschwitz was a work camp, not an ex- extermination camp. She's now in prison in Germany for saying that. Uh, David Irving uh, questioned gas chambers. He was sent to prison in uh, Austria. Yeah, on the other hand, Walter Duranty denied the Holodomor, the uh, the Ukrainian Holocaust. He was given a Pulitzer Prize. Now, there's a double standard. You can You can deny... The Holodomor or the Armenian genocide or any of the genocide, there's only one uh, event in history that you cannot question. And people should be asking why that is. But again, that that diverts us from our topic, but you're absolutely right uh, about the double standard. This has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. I have uh, had many Jewish friends as well as being half Jewish, and many uh, are not involved in any kind of plot. But there definitely is, Israel definitely is a Rothschild proxy state. And they've been involved in many false flag, flag attacks disguised as Arabs. That includes the attack on um, the King David Hotel in 1946, the Levon Affair in 54, the USS Liberty, which we just mentioned in 67, the LaBelle Discotheque in 86, which led uh, Reagan to bomb Libya through a Mossad deception right up to 9-11 and beyond. So uh, this is standard operating procedure for the Mossad, and we're just talking about facts here, nothing to do with racial discrimination of any kind. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a uh, you know great clarification there, and uh, you know, and that's what our listeners want need to know. You know, so look, let's go right to the calls here. Uh, with no further ado, what yeah. do we got here? We got Tony and Metary. Go ahead. You're on the air with Mister Perloff. Go ahead. Oh, hello, guys. Um, you know, I wanted to throw out to you something. I've been thinking about this thing about the the, the uh, upcoming uh, tricentennial and all, and. Uh, and the, the conversation that you know that uh, about the Andrew Jackson statue, and I kept thinking about that, and why Mitch didn't want to promote the taking down of the Andrew Jackson uh, statue that uh, that uh, I've heard of. And you know, about three or four years ago, I remember I perused around on the New Orleans Tourists and Convention Bureau website, and they used to have a lot of stuff back then that they were talking about about the upcoming tricentennial. And one of the things was is that they're supposed to do, and it's funny that you all just played that song, Battle in New Orleans, because according to them, th- th- about three years ago, England is going to send an armada of these wooden ships that have been redone with a bunch of people, I think maybe up to a thousand reenactment soldiers, and they're supposed to do a battle reactment at, at the Chalmette Battlefield, I believe they're going to do this uh, and redo it. Well... I started thinking, well, gee, maybe that's why he don't want to uh, d- defame Andrew Jackson or let that happen, because he's the key figure in the battle in New Orleans. Yeah, he he said, well, well yeah, that, that's a great point, Tony. And uh, he said he wasn't going to, he didn't want that to be his legacy as well. So, you know, that, that I, I don't know, man. I think he Mitch Landry has done enough to divide the people. But, you know, there, there's there's entities behind him coming from the Aspen Institute that are uh, implementing all of this garbage. So look, we appreciate your call. Uh we you know, we got to get back to our to our guests and we're discussing not we well, go ahead. I just was going to tell you that when we in looking at the people that are running for the city in New Orleans, instead of asking if they're going to fix the pumps, the potholes and all the crime, I think that a set of questions should be are you going to where do you stand on the master plan of the city in New Orleans? Wow. 
Uh, Matt, all of the agendas of the New World Order, the UN Agenda 2031, those are the things we need to find out. Exactly, Tony. Addicted what? To all these, uh, these secular and uh, these uh, charitable endowments that do nothing but what, try to take what, over what's, capitalism and hurt the city. Well, Tony, I, I'll say this, and we got to run to the next call so we can get back to uh, Mr. Uh, Perloff's article. But look, Latoya Cantrell is an ASP, 2014 Aspen Institute graduate, so that enough said. So anybody she's votes she's for her? One. Anybody votes for her, you're voting for the New World Order. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. Uh, let's go to Joseph. Uh, Mattery, look. And, you, and Joseph, look, let me say something for Mr. Perloff so he's got some clarification. Mr. Perloff, what's happening in our city is this. You know, Aspen Institute, Agenda 21, we were talking during the break with the producer about how they take these inner cities and they let the crime get out of control. They let the situation get out of control um, in New Orleans, not only with the crime, but they take the monuments down, which creates more divide and conquer. They got the crime scaring both the white and black community out. They have uh, the pumps not working. August 5th, we had a, a little minor flood here that could have easily been handled. They didn't turn the pumps on. They say the pumps since Katrina have not been fixed. We had all billions of FEMA dollars Hundreds here. Hundreds of billions. Yeah, and, and it's uh, nothing is working functionally. There's no transparency on anything. And Mitch Landrieu, who wants the job at the Aspen Institute, he was actually in Aspen when this flood happened, um, who works for Walt Isaacson, Agenda 21. He's the head of the Aspen Institute now, who lives in New Orleans. Uh, you see all this stuff, and you see them create these scenarios in these cities like Detroit, St. Louis, Baltimore, New Orleans, uh, where they basically uh, suppress the, the quality of life. They usurp money and scare people out, and then they restructure this sustainable development permanently on their terms. Because the way they see it, they're fine for uh, middle-class whites or blacks to leave, uh, you know, because then they could bring in the they, more controllable They grid. bring in the subsidized change at that point, to like Walmart, who is subsidized by the government, and they just drive out the mom-and-pop business. But look, let's go to the call, because yeah, we only got... Joseph and Mattery, go ahead. Uh, you got a question from Mr. Perloff pertaining to 9-11? Yeah, I, I just wanted to... Uh, bring up something uh we had this uh 300th anniversary of the founding of the city of the hey Wall. joseph wait wait hold up look we got one minute to the break so uh and, and, you wanna... and look we really need to we need to get back to our guests on 9 11 if you want to talk about the tricentennial we have to do it next week joseph listen 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 we're gonna hold you off till the break i want you to ask a question mr perloff possibly he's really informed on 9 11 um, right, and, okay. I, and I do not want to shortchange your call. We only got about 40 seconds to the break. So, anyways, look, Mr. Perloff, we want to keep anybody calling up. Please have question for Mr. Perloff. He's our guest tonight. Yeah, we're talking about 9-11. We're five days away from the anniversary. So, yeah, Joseph, think about it for about five minutes. We're coming to a break. All and right. and uh, I want you to ask a question to him. He's a great guest. And, uh, yeah, again, 9-11, we're looking at a situation where they're going to pump this propaganda telling us, look, Afghanistan's the root of our problems. Iran, the Muslims are the root of our problems. We're seeing, that's all we've been talking about this segment, is that the, our society has demonized these people, and yet at the same time, we bomb them and relocate them into Europe and North America, and, you know, they use them, weaponize these people, sadly. So, anyways, we'll be right back. And Battle of New Orleans Radio, we're going to get right to you, Joseph. Have a question for Mr. Perloff. And if anyone else wants to call, 504-556-969. 9-11 only. All right. We are back. Battle of New Orleans Radio. Look, we're going to go to Joseph. Look, we got a couple callers. We're going to try to make it quick, Joseph. You have a question for Mr. Perloff. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Hey, are you there, Hello? Joseph? Yeah, am I on? Yeah, you're on. You have you have a question for Mr. Proloff? Well, uh, the, the biggest question, as I'm hoping that he might have some insight as to the truth on it, uh, supposedly on 9-11, uh, there was only one Jewish life lost in the World Trade Center. When the, when the planes attacked from, uh, you know, wherever they came from. And uh, there were just two of them, two of the planes, as far as we know. And... Uh, in theory, uh, or in truth, uh, as, as somewhere in between, right, there were hundreds of Jewish lives lost in the World Trade Center because a lot of Jewish people would, in New York work there. But uh, I've heard that that's not true. They got word from somewhere, somehow, before that well, those planes flew in, that... Uh, not to go there. And only one Jewish life was lost. And so what is really the truth behind that story? All right. Thank you for the question. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Perloff. 
Well, I do know that the Israeli instant messaging company Odigo, its employees received a message not to be in the World Trade Center, I believe it was two hours before the attack. Huh? I don't know um, how many Jews would have been lost. I have read, I've never vetted this, I've read uh, that um, there were some warnings that went out amongst Jewish people. But, you know, there's uh, people uh, who are Jewish, a lot of them are assimilated Americans. They don't go to synagogue. They're not necessarily connected to the Jewish world. I would expect Correct. it probably was more than one given the financial um, character of the World Trade Center. But as far as is, I don't think there were any Israelis in the building that day. Yeah, yeah no, no doubt. Yeah, go ahead, James. I know we've gotten off in the weeds. We try to give the callers a chance because they call up and they listen every week. So, look, we got 40 minutes with you, you know, with commercials. Go ahead, man. Get back to your article and let's really get in where you left off. Okay, well, I'm going to have to do like a 100-yard dash. I know, I'm sorry. A lot of things out uh, but uh, the, we, we talked about the who, and I wanted to talk about the how, and specifically three uh, things, how the towers were destroyed, what initially hit the towers, and uh, what happened to the original planes and passengers. And if we cover this credibly in the time we've got, it'll be a, a small uh, uh, miracle on a human scale. But as far as how the towers were destroyed, I'm well aware of the nanothermite and directed energy weapons, but I do believe after consulting with people who are experts on nuclear weapons, we're dealing with two suitcase nukes. Uh, located in the service pits of Elevator 50. This is the only elevator that ran, the, uh, it was in the middle of the building of each twin tower, only elevator that ran the full distance of e each tower. And uh, the service pits were the only, for that elevator, the only ones that were dug into the uh, bedrock underneath, which meant it would contain the sideways and downward blast of a nuke, uh, shooting it upwards. So we're talking about suitcase nukes small enough to put into a backpack. I'm going to give you my top 10 reasons why this was a nuclear event. And this is real quick. You'll have to see my articles for, cit for citations in support of this, okay? Number one. First responders, what type type of cancer do they get more than any other in, in comparison to its expected rate? It's thyroid cancer. Now, that's a signature of an atomic bomb, which goes off iodine-131, which embeds in the thyroid. Number two, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey uh, examined World Trade Center dust samples, and they found uh, uranium, strontium, thorium, cadmium, and the other elements that can only come from nuclear fission, number three, all that molten steel on those fires that lasted for over three months at the World Trade Center. Uh, a nuclear weapon is extremely hot. It reaches millions of degrees right at its epicenter. Wow. And that will give you the, the molten uh, metal at the bottom. Number four, the towers exploded. They didn't just fall. And there were pieces that weighed multiple tons that embedded themselves in buildings across the street. Now, uh, a nuclear weapon is the most powerful explosive known. It will give you the explosive force to do that. Number five, the inner contents of the towers, all the filing cabinets, toilets, computers, and furniture were totally turned to dust. A nuclear weapon will do that. It's not like a stick of dynamite that uh, it blows up in one second, it's done. No, it keeps on exploding, and its, it's, its force is tremendous, and it will cause that level of damage. Number six, the seismograph readings at Columbia University's uh, Earth Observatory in Palisades, New York, showed off-the-chart spikes when the towers collapsed, indicating that something much more than a rubble collapse had occurred. Number seven, um, the nuclear blast explains the damage to all the other buildings. Uh, this is important. Uh, buildings five, building five was totally ablaze. Building seven was totally ablaze. Building six was cratered out. And why was that? This didn't happen before the towers uh, demolished it. You would have seen smoke plumes come from those buildings. Uh, what people don't know is that underground, the World Trade Center was all interconnected, not only by a sewer system, by a, by a water drainage system that connected to the lowest point for flooding, which is the uh, service pits of Elevator 50 in each building. And when that nuke explosion went off following the path of least resistance upwards in the towers it also followed the path of least resistance underground and into the other buildings created an upward explosion and high heat causing these fires and you can see more evidence of that in the geysers that burst out of the ground at the world trade center when people are escaping the dust cloud which is behind them in front of them smoke is coming out of the sewers you can see the clip of this on my, my uh, web article the smoke is coming out of the sewers in new york city because the, uh, these underground water systems of the World Trade Center ultimately uh, emptied into New York City's sewer system. Number eight is that big dust cloud. You know, if you watch a uh, test of nuclear weapons, when they explode, they don't just create a mushroom cloud, they create a ground level dust cloud. And that's what people were escaping from, it's extremely hot. Number nine, Susan Lindauer, CIA asset, 
who blew the whistle on 9-11, our foreknowledge of it. She went to prison for that. She now has her own radio show. She has stated that the CIA had definite information of an, uh, in advance of the World Trade Center attacks, including the destruction of the World Trade Center by a mini nuke. And uh, no, finally, number 10, Benjamin Netanyahu himself. And it wrote a book in 1995 called Fighting Terrorism. And I'm going to quote him. He said, um, such groups referring to Islamic terror groups nullify the need to have air power intercontinental missiles. They will be the delivery system. In the worst of such scenarios, the consequences cannot be a car bomb, but a nuclear bomb. He underscores the word nuclear in the basement of the World Trade Center. Unquote. So he predicted a nuclear bomb is going to be the next thing that's going to happen in the World Trade Center. And he bragged about that to Tom Brokaw. I've got the clip. You can play for it I'm up from my website. I could play it now, but I'm not going to get into that. But those are my top 10 reasons why this is a nuclear event. And my article also gets into why uh, you did not have these, uh, the um, um, Geiger counter readings you might expect. They're using a low radiation, low uh, fusion bomb, plus several other factors that reduced radiation after the event. Yeah. And Mr. Perloff, listen, I, yeah. and look, we, we, we're talking a lot about 9-11, obviously, coming up on the anniversary. You know, this is such a critical epicenter scenario that happened for the direction of the, the New World Order. This is system. what holds it all together. This yeah. is the glue. And so for the listeners, yeah. like, oh, my God, they're talking about 9-11 again, and they're going on and on and on. You got You guys have to realize that this is something that every year, and we're coming up on it, they push this agenda through this memorial through 9-11 that, like, you know, we see it now. More troops to Afghanistan. Never Trillions anymore. of dollars. Yeah, it's, it's like, well, if we don't do this, we're going to have another 9-11. So to expose this and to question this is our God-given right as Americans and also our right as, uh, you know, free-thinking people. So, I mean, look, you guys have to, the listeners have to really tune in. This, Mr. Perloff is very knowledgeable on this and... I know we have a couple calls. We don't want to get, like Nathan says, too far out in the weeds. But go ahead, Nathan. What you got? You know, what I was saying, look, anybody who wants to find uh, his article, you can go also, if you if you don't go on his website, you can go to uh, Battle of New Orleans uh, Facebook page. I have it posted there. Uh, and then we, we got about a minute left and going to the break. And then uh, 30 more minutes with Mr. Perloff. You know, it's just astounding. This is the glue that holds it all together. And look, following orders and following narrative put out by a bunch of liars does not make you a patriot. I know it's hard to swallow for a lot of the military and, and moms and dads that have lost their sons and daughters uh, in these phony, fraudulent wars. It's a hard, hard pill to swallow. But look, these wars are for a corporate, international interest. They are not for the interest of the American people. And I know it's a hard, hard pill to swallow. It's a, it's a tough one, man. If, if, you know, we had entities coming into our borders, you know, a country that was going to kill us, I would be all for, uh, picking up arms myself and, and going to war. But, you know, this is many, a facet, uh, many faceted, uh, many narrative, uh, uh, based war now. Look, Netanyahu, we gotta go to break. Netanyahu stated that, you know, uh, Israel would benefit greatly from 9-11. So, look, when we come back, more from Mr. Perloff, another 30 minutes, he can get back uh, into discussing his article, Battle of New Orleans. We'll be right back. On WGSO 990. Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back, Battle of New Orleans. I want to go Mr. Perloff, go right to you, James. We want to step out of the way and remove uh, our shelf because we like to get in the way and uh, d deter uh, our guests because we, we talk too much. We do have some calls, but we're going to go let Mr. Perloff talk for a little bit, then we're going to get to our calls. So stay patient, callers. 9-11 and to his article only. Yeah, when we do get to the callers, we want to keep it directly to Mr. Perloff regarding 9-11 and the situation there. We'll so go ahead, Mr. Perloff. Okay, when's our next break? Uh, we got about 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, we talked about what brought the towers down. We're doing this ultra condensed. I'm going to talk now about what I believe hit the towers. Um, you know, I first heard the no planes theory. Um, it, you know, I just laughed at that. Said that Me too. They're trying to introduce cognitive dissonance, et cetera. But then I started looking at it. And, you know, there in Shanksville, there's nothing but a hole. And, you know, the county coroner, Wallace Miller, said there was no wreckage and no bodies in that hole. And then you look at the Pentagon. You see the unscathed lawn, and let me just quote Lieutenant Car uh, Colonel Karen uh, Katowski, Ph.D., U.S. Air Force retired, quote, There was a dearth of visible debris on the relatively unmarked Pentagon lawn where I stood only minutes after the impact. Beyond this strange absence of airliner debris, there was no sign of the kind of damage to the Pentagon structure one would expect for the impact of a large airliner. This visible evidence or lack thereof may also have been apparent to the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, 
who in an unfortunate slip of the tongue referred to the aircraft that slammed into the Pentagon as a missile, unquote, Lieutenant Colonel Katowski. Now, I, I, could, I would go on if we had the time to April Gallup and Major General Albert Stubblebine who said it was a missile. But um, I want to get on to the Twin Towers, which is the main focus of my articles. I started looking at that. Uh, with the help of pilots, and um, I can tell you right now, there's no way that Flight 175, that's the famous one we see hitting the second tower, ever hit uh, that tower. And let's, t- get, let's give you the top reasons why. Number one, every shot from underneath that that uh, apparent plane shows a missile or something that looks the size and shape of a missile attached to it, it lights up when it uh, comes into contact with the South Tower. Now, it's impossible for them to attach uh, a missile-sized object at Logan Airport to the under under uh, surface of a, a plane, not only would the baggage people and maintenance crew notice it, but before every flight, it's required that the pilot or co-pilot do a walk around to inspect the plane. They're not going to miss a cruise sized missile underneath the plane. It, that cannot be 175 hitting that tower. Reason number two, that whatever hit that tower is going at 590 miles per hour. A Boeing can't do that at ground level. It is uncontrollable. And you can watch. Um, uh, pilots for 9-11 Truth, there they have a complete documentary called Airplane Controllability, all about that. Number three is the penetration. That plane flies right through the steel, 14-inch steel columns. That the the uh, the wings and the uh, the aluminum wings and aluminum tail would have sheared off, but instead it goes right inside the building. It doesn't even decelerate. Now its nose, which is made of fiberglass, should have crumpled upon impact. It doesn't. Because on some of the news footage, you see the nose coming out the other side. That's a physical impossibility. So what we're dealing with here, we're not dealing with CGI created after the fact because um, all the footage compiled has shown that whatever hit the tower was following the exact same trajectory. Okay, And they never could have created after the fact CGI that quickly. What we're dealing with here. Uh, is quite evidently, and I have pilot backup on this, it's a, it's a missile. A missile resolves all these problems. It can travel at that speed. It, it can be controlled with precision. Its nose is hardened for penetration, unlike an airliner nose, which gets bashed in by bird impacts. And so you say, well, what do we see going in uh, that uh, looked like a plane? Well, the Air Force in the 1990s had already developed what it called an airborne holographic projector. And I'm going to quote from their own website. I've got the picture of it in the article. You can see that the, uh, they could create a uh, uh, image of an airplane this is for military purposes uh, originally um, in broad daylight. But it says, quote, the holographic projector displays a three dimensional visual image in a desired location. The projector can be used for psychological operations and strategic perception management is also useful for optical deception and cloaking. Uh, I'll just stop the quote there. But that's from the Air Force's own website, okay? So that's not science fiction or paranoia. They already had that technology. And Israel, by the way, was working on stealth applications through its firm El Up as far back as 1987. And if you want to know, is, could the Israelis have fired cruise missiles at us? You bet. Because in 1999, they commissioned their first Dolphin-class submarines, which were capable of firing cruise missiles for the first time hey, in Israeli naval history. Hey, hey James, so James, what, what, not the, not the question. What about? Do you remember? Was that was that TWA Flight 800 uh, off the coast of uh, the East Coast? I believe uh, there was witnesses. I might be wrong about the number, but there was eyewitnesses that said that that was taken down by a missile. Definitely but, taken down by a missile. Apparently, a mistakenly fired missile. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. From, from our end, but the Israelis in the year 2000, the year before 9-11, U.S. Navy observed them test firing their cruise missiles from the submarines in uh, the Indian Ocean, which is pretty chilling. Now, I don't think you could convince U.S. Navy guys, Annapolis graduates and their crews to fire missiles on the Pentagon, the White House and the World Trade Center, but the Israelis would do it. They've done it many, many times. And I do believe, by the way, there was thermite pre-planted there on, on the, um, the um, uh, World Trade Center. Uh, to enhance the effects. And uh, one of the pilots pointed out that probably the reason they had that melting steel, you've seen the melting steel dripping from the South Tower, they used thermite to convince people that jet fuel, yeah, it does melt steel beams, which, of course, it can't. Um, the last thing I'll say about the, uh, the Twin Towers is that some people are absolutely convinced that real airplanes hit them by the limited air, airline debris. The, the pilots outspoken to have discredited that. And not only is there a minimum of airline debris uh, around there, um, but um, not once. Yeah, every piece of airline debris, you know, whether it's an engine or a, uh, a landing gear, it's got a serial number, and it's a unique serial number. You could easily match it to the original 9/11 flights if they could, but the National Transportation Safety Board has never dared do that. They can't do it. 
And uh, if you want to know why uh, they had those urban moving system trucks out, like the panel truck, the mural truck, they're probably out there, you know, uh, moving companies uh, transport large objects. They got dollies and strong guys, and that's probably what they were doing there in the World Trade Center area on uh, 9-11, besides planning the small stuff like the, the unburned hijacker passport. But that's it for, for what hit the towers. Yeah, yeah I, I'm starting to believe that no planes hit the, as well. The more you watch it, there's no way that a plane is going to go through, you know, plane, a tin can, aluminum can is going to go through the side of this steel uh, structure that, that was just built so uh, well. Uh, the last thing I want to get into, and we'll see how much time we have, is uh, what happened to the planes and passengers. And I'm going to give you a take that um, most people will never have heard before. Um, but we'll, we'll see how far I can go here before we hit a break or a call. Um, uh, you know that there's a lot of planted evidence beforehand. You know, the, the guys who went to the bars in, in Florida, the sports bars, and paid for lap dances and argued about the bills and left behind copies of their credit card receipts and their driver's licenses and their business cards and left the Koran at the bar. The you know, fake the hijackers? Koran. Yeah, the alleged is, Islamic hijackers. And of course, they left a Koran and a, and a flight training manual and a at Logan Airport in, in the parking lot in a car. And of course, Mohammed uh, Atta's luggage didn't make it onto Flight 11. And that also conveniently had all the names of the hijackers on there. But here's what happens, okay, in the truth movement. We, uh, we uh, found out eventually that half those hijackers named by the FBI were alive. Yeah. And that these hi alleged hijackers had no flying skill and never been in a Boeing before. And so we conclude that there was no hijacking. We say it must have been an electronic hijack. And then we would start to turn our wrath on the passengers and the flight attendants say those guys were working with the CIA and they faked those phone calls and, and they got paid off. Or uh, we say that they got bumped off with the CIA and the CIA used voice morphing, et cetera. Well, I'm gonna, I have a different take on that, which is that they were real hijackers, but not the alleged Muslims. It was Danny Lewin's group. It was their elite special ops, the Israeli special ops, the Sayeret and Matt Kyle. And these guys knew exactly how to fly Boeing. Israel's got plenty of 757 and 767 in its LL fleet. They'd flown as jump seaters. They'd flown as co-pilots. They knew all those controls, and they knew exactly how to get into the co into the cockpit. You know how they got into the cockpit? How's that? They got the key. You know, in, yeah. as of uh, 2001, every uh, cockpit had to be locked upon takeoff. But you know what? It was a standard lock and key set for every Boeing. They didn't have a unique lock and wow. key set. So all the Israelis had to do is borrow keys from El Al, and they walk into that cockpit, and they kill those those um, those pilots instantly, probably by injection. They're in the cockpit. They lock the door behind them. They're now in control, and they know how to fly that thing, but they're not about to commit suicide. That is not their mission. Their mission is to, uh, is to fake the hijacking. And I found this amazing sentence in the London Telegraph, September the 21st, 2001, quote, Accounts from the doomed planes indicate that the hijackers encouraged people to call their families and tell them what was happening, unquote. Well, why would you hijackers who uh, are planning to kill you, why would they encourage you to call their families? Suddenly they're so like, no, they wanted to establish the Muslim narrative, same as they did with Charlie Hebdo when those military guys went outside Charlie Hebdo offices and for the, all the cameras who sh were shouting, Allahu Akbar, right? With their masks on, <laughs> pretending to be Muslims. It's the same deal that Mossad and uh, the Israelis have been doing this for years. Okay, so um, that raises the question of what happened to the planes. And um, my uh, the co-producer of my movie Shattering, Marilyn Great movie. was, a, was, a, was, a, was a, a career flight attendant. And she asked the question, why do they insist on only using planes bound for California? Why? It's because they wanted a lot of fuel to make their getaway. Good. These guys took these planes across the Atlantic. What's right next to the Pentagon and the World Trade Center and the White House? The Atlantic. They went straight out into the Atlantic. And, and they cut off the passenger phone calls by, pull, by pushing a hey, button in the cockpit. Hold, hold that, hold that, hold that okay. thought. We're coming to the break. What Last segment. We're coming up after this with Mr. Perloff. JamesPerloff.com. Unbelievable information. Please read this article. We'll be right back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Battling Wallens Radio, Mr. James Perloff. You can check out this great article at jamesperloff.com, 9-11 Simplified. Let, let's, let's knock out these uh, calls we got, really we got, quickly. We got, yeah, we can take one call. Yeah, let's go to Rick in Arizona. Yeah, go on, one minute. Go ahead, Rick. Go ahead, Rick. You got a question for Mr. Perloff? The only thing that was real on 9-11 was the people in the media lying to you. I don't think anybody died. I don't think there's any planes. It answers all the questions. It's just a TV show. 
there's not one piece of scrap metal sold on the internet from any of those planes anywhere in the United States. A piece of metal from the Titanic is worth millions, but is there anything on the black market? They, they scrapped the it to China. They, they sent it overseas to be scrapped. Planes, anything. There's, the whole thing is fake, except for the people lying to you. Uh, Think about it. Nobody died because there was nobody in the nobody in the towers. It took three years to wire those buildings. And if you think the project engineer is going to let you fly planes into it, I don't think so because you're going to destroy the sequence of the explosions in that building. Okay. Everything yeah. went perfect, man, first time. Hey, hey, hey Rick, that's a, that, that's a great point. Look, Rick, call us back next week, man. We Sorry we didn't have much time. Yeah, call us back next week, man. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Perlov, what's your take on his comment? Um. Well, he's absolutely right about uh, the, the, none of those uh, plane parts turned up. And again, I, as we're saying, they uh, couldn't uh, match a serial number. If they could, they would have debunked the whole 9-11 truth movement. But they don't dare because those uh, the debris, limited uh, airplane debris did not come from flights 175 and 11 at the Twin Towers. I do believe people died, though, in those towers. And I do believe uh, the people on the planes were real people uh, who did die. Uh, none of them has uh, come forward and they would never take a a chance on somebody on one of those planes having remorse. I mean, I've, I, I've talked to people who had friends who were lost on those flights, and uh, these are just regular folk, you know, um, people I know from church and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, as a hockey star who I admired uh, uh, on one of those planes, uh, you know, he's never been seen since that day. I believe that they are dead, but not the hijackers. I believe that except for the ones on 93, I, I believe they all made it back to Israel. So, sound, but maybe I can pick up that narrative. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, before. go ahead. Um, so the narrative is this. They take the planes over the Atlantic, and the reason they wanted only California-bound planes, they wanted a lot of fuel on board. Now, the way they killed the passengers, I thought they probably threw a, a poison gas, maybe cyanide or something, into the, into the cabin and then locked themselves in the cockpit. But uh, the pilots, one of the uh, pilots corrected me, said that that could circulate back to the cockpit. So the way to do it, the way to kill the passengers, you take up to altitude and you depressurize the cab. Uh. You've got unlimited oxygen in the cockpit, but they have 15 minutes at the most when those automatic uh, masks come down. They'll be, the passenger will be dead in 15. In fact, if you prematurely deploy those, those, uh, those uh, masks, you can uh, take the plane up to 40,000 feet. The passengers will be dead in one minute wow. of the depressurization and no oxygen. So that is the cleanest way to kill them. Their destination would be the Azores. Now, the distance from Boston to L.A. is 2,000, a little over 2,400 miles. The distance from New York to the Azores, these are the islands off of Portugal, is just a little over 2,400 miles. Now, on, on the Azores, why the Azores? Because the CIA operates off of a, a military base there called Lajis. The planes are headed for Israel, but they have to refuel one time. Lajis is an official uh, diversion airport for uh, for a commercial aircraft. There's a out of uh, fuel plane from Canada that actually went to Lajis. This is a New York Times story on September the 10th, 2001. Landed on Lajis for refueling. So Dick Cheney simply gives the order. You know, the, all flights were canceled to America that day. The European flights had to turn around and go back to Europe. So these planes from 9/11 so we blended in. Uh, they landed on Lodges and, and said that uh, they needed a refuel. Every, the officers inside are not paying attention. They're glued to the TV watching the events of 9-11. The planes refuel. You need just one man for that. You take off and you fly across sub-Saharan Africa uh, over the poor countries like Mauritania and Chad, over to Saudi Arabia, and which is Israel's silent uh, ally. And with uh, Saudi permission, you fly straight up to Israel and into an Israeli hangar. And that is the safest place to dispose of these planes and passengers is in Israel. That's the one place you'll never find them, except for 93, which um, we can get into very yeah. briefly. Yeah, go, go ahead, James. Understand. Okay, 93, I do agree with Chris Bolin and other researchers that 93 was shot down. There was scat It was not the hole. That was the discarded missile that was intended for the White House. But the plane itself was scattered far and wide, was shot down by missiles. And there's a lot of footage taken that day, early in the day, where they said that we understand this is Fox News and other stations saying that we understand a plane has been intercepted by the Air Force. They didn't even know it was called 93 yet. But the reason they shot it down was not to save the White House. They shot it down because of Let's Roll. And I believe Let's Roll really happened. Uh, they were uh, retaking that cockpit. They got the Israeli guy outside of it. They were ramming their way in. And when this was overheard, Cheney gave the order to shoot it down because, you know what, if they, there was a pilot amongst the passengers named Donald Green. If they were able with air traffic control to, you know, to land that plane after subduing the Israeli, I'm calling them Israeli hijackers, and they landed that plane even with a rough landing, when the police uh, captured the hijackers and found out the Israelis, 
the whole plan would have gone down the drain. There would have been no Middle East wars, no wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, forget it. And Apex and Israel's special relationship with us would have been destroyed. That's why they shot down 93, to say, not to see the White House, but to say the whole 9-11 scheme. And the Israeli uh, special ops on that plane, if they had any smarts, they wouldn't have even tried to hijack it because uh, what they'd already done to the Pentagon and World Trade Center was enough. You know, Flight 93 left 40 minutes late and fouled everything up for them. But in any event, that's what you'll find with a documentation on my uh, website. My articles are called 9-11 Simplified and Conversations with a Pilot, Airline Pilot, about 9-11. So that's kind of my spiel. So we can go to your call list now. But thanks for let me fit in uh, the basic, the condensed uh, uh, Reader's Digest version of uh, what it, I believe happened. All right, we, I'm we'll, not insisting on this, by the way. I'm just throwing it out in the hopes that we can advance this narrative uh, towards a closer understanding of the truth. All right, Mr. Perloff, we got about two minutes left. Look, we'll go to one caller really quick. Yeah. Phil the Patriot, well, make it quick, buddy. What I you got? brothers and sisters, they really do have weather machines that can generate hurricanes, tornadoes, and storms. They can also dissipate them if they want to. Oh that, All right, Phil. That, thank that, you, man. That, that was very quick. That, that, Appreciate it. Thank you, Long Phil. Long-time listener, and he uh, helped us many a time with some uh, personal stuff we needed for the show. But, Mr. Perloff, any final thoughts, anything you want to plug, or any final things you want to say to the listeners? we got about a minute and a half. Uh, well, God bless your listeners, and uh, you know, uh, God bless you guys for uh, – providing a platform for people to tell the truth. You guys are spot on. I can tell every time I'm on here, you guys know exactly what's going on. I learned a lot from you guys, for example, about Aspen and Agenda 21, what they're doing down there in, in New Orleans and and, uh, and uh, duplicating that in other cities. Uh, you guys are uh, a real beacon of truth down there. So I just appreciate uh, being on the show, and uh, it's great hanging out with you guys, great hanging out with people who are out of the matrix. Yeah, it, it it feels good, James. You know, once you once you see really what's going on and you learn the truth, you can never go back, man. And you, yeah. it's it's really easier to you know move through life at that point. You know what I'm saying? You can see what's coming. Okay, so they want to dox us. We'll be our own boss for the rest of our life. That's what we've decided. That's it, we're fine with that. And we have to work for ourselves. You because want to dox us, our listeners, the people doxing or listening to our show right now. We're fine with that. We're ready for this. Okay, we're not going anywhere as far as that's concerned. You know, if you want you to guys try, you would have made pretty good soldiers in the Confederate Army. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, listen, Mr. Perloff, you look, we've had um, a lot of entities lately, lately trying to shut our show down and and give us a hard time. So, to our listeners, we appreciate it. We hope to stay on for a long, long time. And if not, you know, you guys know what happened. And uh, Mr. Perloff, we're glad to have you on, and we hope to have you on again. Yeah, we, uh, I look forward to that, guys. We appreciate James, and, and I know you probably missed some points, and, and you know we, we kind of get off in the weeds sometimes, but uh, you know, all right, we'll have to talk about. <laughs> man, we pr- appreciate it, James. You have a great and blessed night, man. It's always great. Look, y'all go check him out, jamesperloff.com. Go follow him on Twitter. Go read his book, my one of my favorite books of all time. Truth is a lonely warrior. Go read that, man. That's a must read. So please go read that. And uh, James, really appreciate hey, it. Look, we got 45 seconds. Look, don't get distracted by the NFL stuff. Okay. We got that coming up in four days. You know, look at the, the bread and circus, Mr. Perloff, you know, I think he thinks it's funny. It is kind of funny, but it's sad at the same time. And yeah, we fall yeah, for it too. Yeah. It's really they, sad. They, they want us distracted. By they the, want they, us they distracted. They're pushing that agenda you, to keep people uh, away from the truth. And what's uh, the the doom that could overtake us by a uh, yeah? It's bread and circuses. It's uh, for women. It's soap operas uh, traditionally, and for men, it's a sports. You yeah, know? yeah. Look, put your put your game and throw and turn it off. Put your box of wine down. You got to pay attention to what's going on, ladies. Okay, Friday night Game of Thrones, box of wine. That's enough. Football men, put your fantasy football aside and pay attention. The New World Order's here. Agenda Twenty One's here. We'll be back next week. Battle of New Orleans Radio. 80s to 90 with scattered activity Saturday and Sunday. Except for Jose, things are okay in the tropics. Ralph Sanji, WGSO. Ladies and gentlemen, the last president of the United States of America. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths and a secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. Battle of New Orleans.
New Orleans Radio with your hosts, Nathan Lawrence, Caleb Hitt, and Goyen on 990 WGSO. In 1814, we took a little trip along with Colonel Jackson. All of my people come ride with me, united we stand against tyranny. Gotta fight the system non-violently, gonna keep us this until we finally free. All of my people come ride with me, united we stand against tyranny. Gotta fight the system non-violently, gonna keep us this until we finally free. Fully loaded weapon, rapping power to them people. If you're riding with me, put your fist up high. United, we fighting until the system dies. They victimizing us, hypnotizing us with the lies that the media's providing us. They rely on us to comply with the views that they choose that are just dividing us. Ooh, that they conquer us. It's the oldest trick in the book. But we ain't gonna fall for it. They're not at all legit. They in the business of crook. Listen to me now. Companies see people as objects. Nothing but money to show deep in their pockets. Some of me running with the elitists who profit by feeding the products that I leave from the toxic. Big farmers only got one concern. That's the monetary wealth. They don't want to find a cure. They want your mind to blur because they don't profit from your wealth. Why with me now? Monsanto. Hot damn, yo. Look at that food. Tell me how the hell that grow. Genetically modified organism. Chemical blind in your third eye vision. We're on drugs. They enterprise in the prison. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Battle of New Orleans Radio right here on 990 AM WGSO. I'm Nathan Lawrenson, along with my terrific co-host, Mr. Caleb Hitt. And we're also going to be having Mr. Tory Grossman, excuse me, uh, co-hosting the show with us in here in just a moment. Uh, good old partner, uh, Goyam, could not join us tonight. Uh, he will be listening, though, so we appreciate uh, him listening and... You know, it's been a just a whirlwind of hurricanes uh, lately. It seems like every time we turn around, there's a storm coming. And it's been very, very busy, very, very active. And look, Caleb, before I bring you on in a second, I, I just want to say this and get your take on this. Um, they promoted this Hurricane Irma as being this giant superstorm, and no doubt it did some damage in Florida, mainly like Big Pond Key and one of the other keys in that area. A lot of tornado damage. You could see trees, trees uprooted. Um, but they promoted this storm. It's just, you know, coming in to landfall as a Category 4. Excuse me. But that's totally, totally not true. That storm wasn't a Category 4. It wasn't a Category 3, and I detailed this using um, the National Weather Service's own information against them. The Weather Channel showed the reporter on, you know, in Miami, and he's reporting, it's like, yeah, I'm at the Rickerbacker, in front of the Rickerbacker Bridge, I think that's the name of it, I might be butchering that. I'm in front of the bridge. You know, the, the winds gusted up to 100 miles an hour. Then he says a couple of seconds later, well, they were at least 80 miles an hour. Well, wait a minute. Number one, the storm has to have sustained winds of 140 miles an hour, not gusts. Number two, he just contradicted himself by showing, by saying 100 and then 80. So that's a contradiction. Well, why he's saying this He's not realizing that the weather channel has the wind gauge up on the left-hand side, and it shows wind gusts 71 miles an hour, sustained wind at 49 miles an hour. So that being said, you know, it's just one big giant contradiction, and at that time, Miami was on the bad side of the storm. The storm was 25 miles east of Key West, putting Miami on the wrong side of the storm. That's just one blatant example. And while they're calling this thing a Category 3, Category 4, they're showing the wind speeds. 75 miles an hour, 89 miles an hour, 67 miles an hour, uh, 49 miles an hour. They're never showing actual wind speeds of 140 miles an hour like they're showing on the right hand of the screen. So then let's fast forward at 3 o'clock. 
and it, if anybody thinks I'm lying about this, you can go to Battle of New Orleans Facebook page <clears throat> and Nathan Lawrence's Facebook page, and you can see uh, these videos that I were play that I was playing using their own information, and I was showing you the television. So you can go check it out. Well, at three o'clock, the storm was coming into Naples. Naples is on the wrong side of the storm, and there's hardly any storm surge. That's a that's an indicator that it's not a category four or a category three. Then they they show Naples. Well, excuse me. I go to Google Weather. And Google weather at that exact same time in Naples, wind 55 miles an hour. Now, 55 miles an hour, look, that still can do a lot of damage. And, you know, it, that's, it can cause damage. But that is not a Category 3 or a Category 4. Here in Louisiana, when Katrina hit in 2005, we had, in Slide L, we had 20 to 25 feet of storm surge in a Category 3. There was pictures of waves off the coast, coast of Biloxi at almost 45 feet tall. Okay. And they showed the storm surge in Florida, a big pond key at three and a half feet. Now, granted, three and a half feet can do some damage. But that doesn't match up to a Category 4. And I'm just stating this because this is just more tricks, you know, that the media plays and lies to us about. You know, and, and they work with our government. You know, they've already mobilized all of these people, millions and millions and millions of people. They've mobilized, moved them out of their homes, you know, told them there wasn't going to be nothing to come back to. And, you know, so there's just many facets of this as well. You know, by them declaring national emergency, you know, the, the, gov- the state gets to get uh, funding and, and that whole, you know, whole uh, kit and caboodle. There's just a lot to it, you know. So, you know, that's just one thing I want to talk about. But also... Before I bring on our other co-host, Caleb, and we also have uh, Tori Grossman uh, with us now, I want to discuss what 9-11 just happened. Yeah, I know we discussed 9-11 at nauseam last week, but there's a lot of stuff we didn't discuss. And also, you know, I think Caleb and Tori can give their perspective on 9-11. And after we discuss 9-11 for a while, let's, let's talk about some positive things. We can get into some holistic healing and what can we do in our own lives to really resist you know, this new world order plan that they try to shove down our face and our throat on an hourly, daily, second, uh, secondly basis. So, uh, you know, without further ado, how you doing tonight, Caleb? How you doing tonight, uh, Tori? I'm very good. Doing good. Yeah, yeah, glad to have you all on the show tonight, man. Uh, so I, I don't know if y'all caught what I what I was saying, and I don't know if y'all witnessed um, any of those things that, that I, I, I was discussing um, what, what's your take on what I was saying, Caleb, about the, uh, the, the National Weather Service and, you know, the media lying about uh, these wind speeds? I don't know. I just think it's very interesting that the, I think what you were saying about the, the Weather Channel, about the contradiction of the wind speeds is obviously very striking to me. I mean, um, I think people have always wondered about hurricanes and uh, ever since... Uh, Project uh, Cirrus occurred and back in 1947. That's when uh, they, the uh, General Elect- Electric Corporation, the U.S. Army, and the uh, and the Navy and the Air Force seeded the hurricane. It was actually heading east out to the Atlantic. They seeded it, and then suddenly it slams into it turns immediately turns direction and then slams into Savannah, Georgia. And there was a public outcry because of that lawsuits and everything. So uh, they shut that program down for eleven years. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. What, what's your you, you you have a take on that, Tori, or, or you want to say anything about that? Um, I mean, I guess I have some questions because uh, I don't really know too much about it. I wasn't watching so much on the, the TV um, as far as what the reporters were saying um, because they've been reporting on it nonstop. But um, yeah, right. So if it, really, if it was if it was a lot bigger than than they're saying when it landed. Is that because of some uh, sort of geoengineering buffer that they put in place, or because didn't it really mess up the islands um, leading up to Florida? So how does that work? Yeah, I mean they, they did. St. Thomas, there's pictures, you know, of it really being devastated. But uh, I believe it was CNN and one of the media outlets did get caught using five-year-old pictures. They got busted showing pictures and video um, 
uh, of, of the storm, and it wasn't even from uh, Hurricane Irma. Come to find out it was from a storm from five years ago. So, you know, it is so difficult. Go ahead. Radar picture, like radar no, no, or- no, pictures, like damaged pictures and, and, and pictures, uh, uh, you know, at, during the storm. You know, so it's it's so hard. It's like, you know, the, the boy that cries wolf. I mean, you just <laughs> lied to all the time. You know, and if people want some examples of the media lying to you, just please. And I, I've, you know, sh- you talked about this clip at nauseum. Go Google in C- CNN, the fake Scud missile attack. And if anybody has never looked at that video, it's it's hilarious. CNN says they're in Saudi Arabia during this uh, Scud missile attack. And they show the reporters they have some uh, some palm trees blowing. They show this Scud missile, and it's got Scud, S-K-U-D, written on it with, like, a Sharpie. And there's, like, sirens in the background. It's hilarious. And come to find out, they were on top of the CNN building the whole time. If you go watch the whole the whole video, you know, they're ordering food, and the one reporter's smoking a joint. And it, it's, uh, it, it's really hilarious. And, you know, that's just one blatant example of CNN putting out fake news. And it's not just them. You know, all these this news is very bias and is very skewed if it's on the television it's called programming you're being programmed for sure Mm. you know so look we got one minute before we go to break mr caleb hit the daily resistance.com reporter and a co-host is with us we have former army ranger mr tory grossman is with us and we're going to be discussing you know just really you know topics that's that's happening now 9 11 and taking phone calls and also, you know, trying to discuss some solutions, which you can do daily in your own life, because that's what it's about. We're never really going to change, you know, the district of criminals. We're never going to change these elite, but we can do things in our own lives to try to remove ourselves from this new world order system that tries to keep, you know, the chains around our throat. And once you kind of become red pilled on this, at least you can navigate through the storm. So, Listen, Battle of New Orleans Radio, you know, tune in. Tell your family and friends about us. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Battle of New Orleans Radio right here on 990 AM WGSO, home of the First Amendment, heart of the Crescent City. You know, look, we the, the, uh, the show tonight is going to be very loose. We're going to be discussing pretty much anything you want to talk about, you know, as callers go. But I would like to discuss, you know, we were talking about weather modification. You know, what's going on. We've been talking about that a lot lately. People think that's some kooky conspiracy theory, but it's on record, okay? And I think it's very important because millions of people's lives get affected, okay? You know, one way or the other, you know, and, and they have the ability to change the outcome. So that, that's why I think it's important. But, you know, not only I, – I also want to get into 9-11 because 9-11 is the glue that holds this whole thing together. Okay, they use 9-11 to send troops overseas like our friend uh, Mr. Grossman there. They use 9-11 to, you know, decimate the Middle East. They use 9-11 to create terrorism, well, what they call terrorism overseas, and, and it's come back home in some shapes. A lot of the terrorists that they say are terrorists over here are usually FBI facilitated. I mean, it's it's happened almost every time. The, the FBI has at least, uh, like, coddled them and allowed some of these things to happen, and then they swoop in to play the savior. I mean, it's, it, it's, it happens time and time again. So we see that aspect of it. We see the trillions of dollars that have gone into this black hole, uh, you know, fighting this this thing. The trillions of dollars that has vanished out of the Pentagon's budget. Uh, I mean, you know, out of their books, 11, almost 11 trillion since 9-11. Where's that going? Hey, that's half of this phony debt they say we have, even though really we're in debt quadrillions of dollars. Okay, so... That, that that's at least half of the, uh, the you know, the 19 trillion there. Uh, so th- there's many aspects of this. You know, when you go buy a home, this and I'm, I don't know, Caleb or, or uh, Tori, if you're familiar, if you're familiar with this, or aware of this, when you go purchase a, purchase a house, you actually have to the, the banker has to go through 
a Patriot Act book. It's a big, thick book the banks have, and they have to follow Patriot Act guidelines in the banking now. So what's y'all's take on that, uh, Tori? Were you familiar with that? No. Uh, do, you, do you know what that entails? No, it's the, the book is inches and inches and inches thick, and they make you sign all these waivers and these forms now dealing with the Patriot Act when you go purchase at home now. So that's just another, you know, that's just another facet of this whole thing. Well, it, go ahead. Um, I, it seems to me like um, – Post 9-11, uh, there was really just this giant rollout of all these, um, uh, 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 you know, government spying and uh, in these this infrastructure that uh, pretty clearly existed behind the scenes. But then all of a sudden, post 9-11, it was given like this like sanction to be a part of our lives. And um, we you know, if, if we really didn't have much choice in the matter because of um, of how uh how strongly 9-11 was pushed on us. And I think everybody probably is listening to this is um, or if you listen to the guest last week um, is aware that there's, you know, the official story doesn't hold up to scrutiny at all. And um, so it was really kind of just like uh, it was kind of pushed on us. And it doesn't feel right. Yeah. What, what, what's your take, Caleb? Well, 9-11 has been used to reshape the world and uh, recreate a new America. Huh. And uh, did many different ways. Well, with the, you know, with the like what Tori was talking about with the surveillance state, the police state, and everything that's been going on in the Middle East. Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, that was an inside and outside job. You know, it was done by elements inside our government, outside of our government, foreign powers, you name it. Um, so you know, it's very, very disturbing. And now you see, oh, remember nine eleven? Uh, you know, never forget. Which, yeah, don't forget. But you know what? Don't just buy the narrative hook, line, and sinker. That's not being a patriot. You know, a patriot is not somebody, in my opinion, that just, you know, sucks uh, on the government teat and, and just believes everything that they sell you. You know, a patriot is somebody who, you know, w- wants to fight for their land, wants to fight for their country and, and, and their brothers and sisters. And... Just, just never questioning. I believe, man, does us, does everyone, a great injustice and a great disservice, you know, to themselves. Uh, so it's very, very disheartening to see people. You know, I, I have friends of mine who served, and you know, the day nine eleven happened. You know, not, excuse me, the anniversary a couple of days ago. They said, look, don't, don't anybody put any of these conspiracy theories on my wall. I don't even want to hear about it. Look, man, it happened. And y'all just need to all the conspiracy theorists just need to accept it, basically. And and, and that kind of boy, it pissed me off. Go ahead. I mean, um, uh, a patriot upholds the Constitution, and um, the uh, Patriot Act uh, is unconstitutional, in my opinion. And um, everything that's going on is, uh, you know, it the, it the the perpetration against the American people is profound. And once we realize that. And uh, if you just put some pieces together, it's pretty clear and it's right in front of us. All you have to do is examine it. Yeah. And um, it's it's very un- – the Patriot Act is very unpatriotic. Look, we're coming to another break. Well, these breaks are coming quick. When we come back, more with Tori and Caleb, and we'll be taking your phone calls. So, look, Battle New Orleans Radio, look, don't believe the narrative hook, line, and sinker. You don't have to believe me. Go research these things. I don't have all the answers. But you know what? I do know we're being lied to. And to be able to progress in the awakening, well, I'll discuss that when we come back. Valley New Orleans Radio. People, are you ready? It's time that we stand our ground. Throw up your fist and hold it steady. Because we are never going to... Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Valley New Orleans Radio. Look, we're about to take calls. But before we do, I want to throw something out there. We were discussing this in the break and... You know, we lost another uh, another listener last week. You know, Matthew from Matter. He said he wasn't going to be listening anymore. He couldn't. He couldn't. Uh, couldn't take it anymore because we call out these uh, these entities. But so we're sad to lose you, Matthew. I hope I hope you can tune back in. You know, eventually. But that being said, we were discussing. You know, the off air, the 
foreign influence, you know, that call helped stir 9-11, helped cause 9-11. We had a dual citizen, Dove Zakheim, who was over the Pentagon's money that disappeared. Okay, $2.3 trillion right before 9-11. They moved the Pentagon, 188 budget analysts and bookkeepers of the Pentagon. Excuse me. They moved it to this new spot in the Pentagon right where the quote-unquote plane hit, even though there's no evidence of a plane. You can go watch CNN reporters say, I don't see any evidence of a plane. Not one blade of grass was, was, was ruined. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. They moved the, the budget analyst right in the exact spot the plane hit, quote-unquote plane. I think it was a missile myself. Um, and they were killed. That was the people that could follow the money. We had this guy, Dove Zakheim, who was over the money. And then another two trillion come up vanish right after that. He was a dual Israeli citizen. And why is that important? I don't care if he was in Argent Argentine. We have foreign powers inside of our government. How is that possible? How? I, I just don't understand. I, what's your take on that, uh, Tori? And then we're going to go to some of these calls. Okay. Well, um, you know, as far as this specific person, I've never heard that name before, so I can't comment on it, that specific. And doesn't that say something? That that the, the, the television has never even brought this guy up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, there's a lot. It, like the the thing that I've got, the question I've got about this, or the the beef I've got with this, is that um, you know, I was uh, I I was on four deployments. I was doing night raids. I was black masking people in the middle of the night. I was uh, I was um, the fist for uh, the military uh, war machine, and um, but why is it that we are uh, there's a stigma around questioning who our even our allies are, or um, to like to what benefit we're even in uh, the region, and um, why are why are allies like are these connections obscured, and uh, I, like after this last guest this la um, last week talking about um, Mr. Perloff. Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, uh, it, it bothers me because like clearly, uh, Saudi Arabia w was involved. Clearly it, we had so many levels of breakdown within our own government that it's on, it's as if they let it happen, which is extremely suspicious. Um, it, you know, the inside job narrative in, in my mind is the only one that, uh, should be examined. We just need to figure out what that means because the mainstream me uh, narrative is so full holes that it's like a pail without a bottom. Um, and so you can't even you, – you just throw it out all together. But like the thing that people haven't been putting into place or there's this cognitive dissonance around is the Israeli factor and how much it benefits Israel for us to be in the Middle East at all. You know, like if they were, if they were invading countries that I was invading um, as part of the uh, Ranger Strike Force, like, it, you know, if there was an Israel flag on my shoulder, there would be huge problems. They, but we we can do it, and but we don't even know why we're over there because we think it's for 9-11, or at least the guys that I was working with and I did when I joined, because I joined in 2008 right out of high school. Like We, we thought we had noble uh, reasons for why we were being over there for the most part. And uh, you know, then I find out about the opium. I find out about the lithium in Afghanistan. I found out about the oil and how it supports uh, the dollar. And I realized that we have connections with Saudi Arabia. And but there's this cognitive dissonance around Israel altogether. And when I bring it up with people that I know, I've had, I brought it up with uh, my dad, my mom and a friend of mine. And uh, every person I brought it up with had a physical reaction of like repulsion to even thinking about it. They oh, they didn't want to think about it. My buddy started bobbing up and down as if like he, it just made too much sense for him to, 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 to under to grok. But because it, it makes it clearly makes sense. But why is it that we don't look there? And I mean, it's kind of, are we being programmed? Is there some sort of psyop going on in our country that makes us uh, view that whole situation as if we can't touch it? You know, I was brought up being told that Israel is, um, the Israelis are God's people and uh, chosen lot. people. Um, in, and you know, I'm, I grew up in a strong Christian family and uh, I think we're all God's children. And I don't think that, uh, I don't want to diminish them, and I. But at the same time, like, are we being are we being mind controlled into not even knowing where our blind spots are? That's the question that I have. 
What do you guys think? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, absolutely. Caleb, go ahead and tell uh, Tori. And after you say this, we're going we're gonna to go to calls. Tell Caleb, I mean, excuse me, tell Tori briefly in the listening audience what your encounter was with Congr- Congressman Bill Johnson, who went to Israel. Yeah, well, he had a uh, conference here in my local area, in my district, in uh, uh, southeast Ohio. And he um, told of his a visit he took to Israel. He met with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he also visited the uh, the Golan Heights. And I think he was even at the uh, the military, uh, the field hospital there. And he spoke of uh, you know bom- he could hear the the bombings going on, and he admitted that when these um, Soldiers come; these injured troops or terrorists uh, come across the defense from uh, or on the, from the serious side where all the fighting was going on. They don't even bother questioning what side they're fighting for. They, they were ISIS uh, troops. That he admitted yeah. they were ISIS troops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he did. He did admit that some of I asked him that specifically if uh, some of those were actually connected directly with ISIS, and he, he said yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah. He, I remember Caleb. Not to cut you off, he was like, "Yeah, I'm paraphrasing you. Yeah, you know the Israelis are so great. You know they help everybody. You know the, even the ISIS fighters. They would come across the Golan Heights, they'll bandage them up, and they send them right back. They're so great." Yeah, I was trying to. I was trying to bring up uh, the UN uh, observation force that they have there, as far as keeping an eye on um, both the Israel Israeli side and the Syrian side. Because there was already media reports of um, <clears throat> uh, IDF soldiers uh, handing crates to uh, soldiers on the other side of the fence, and and they was there was lots of speculation as to were they directly dealing with ISIS uh, terrorists or in, in Al Qaeda and Al Nusra uh, members there. They, they got caught. There was Israeli generals in Iraq running teams of. "Quote unquote ISIS terrorists." Okay, I mean it's happened on multiple occasions. But look, let's take some of these calls. Our first caller on the line, we got Joseph. Then we're going to Paul. Then you, Richie. Go ahead, Joseph. Uh, um, okay, am I on? Yes, sir. You're on, brother. Go ahead. Okay. On August fourteenth, two thousand eleven, according to a little paper I just recently found, I wrote the date down. I was kind of fuzzy on exactly when. I'm pretty sure that's what it is, uh, the date. August 14, 2011. A formerly classified document was declassified. And it was called Operation Codename North Woods. Oh, yeah. All right. Now, North Woods was something that many people like to look at as a kind of like a model for what happened on 9-11. It was basically, it was devised during the Cold War. Yeah, and not not to cut you off, Joe, Pentagon. I think that was 1962, 19, early 1963. Yeah, that. It was basically to to make Fidel Castro look like he had gone crazy and he wanted to start a war with uh, America. He was trying to kill Americans in their own towns and cities and villages and hamlets and neighborhoods and whatever, and, uh, you know, it basically, it, it, Fidel Castro now was going to look like a terrorist, all right? But this was the interesting thing of, of, about what happened on that on this date, August 14th, 2011. I was sure that this subject would have gotten talked about a lot on George Norrie's Coast to Coast show, which comes on at 12 midnight. So I was waiting. I was really waiting to hear this show come on uh, and this part of this new subject talked about. What was fascinating was five minutes to midnight, the signal for that show on whatever station it was on, I might have been, uh, I don't think it was on uh, Fox. It was on. I think it might have been uh, the Channel Four network. Uh, but the, anyway, the thing is, the station that was supposed to carry it, it went out. It, it was not 
that's sending out the signal. For four hours, that show was blocked from being broadcast. I don't know if we talked about the um, uh, the Dolph Woods document or not, but this, the but the thing that was the most shocking was five minutes to midnight. The signal was was restored. The program was allowed to finish, and I realized at that point we are living in uh, a, a the national security state. I kind of like a a police state where we are monitored, we are controlled what the news we hear. If they don't want us to hear it, they block it out. And I was shocked. For the first time in my life, I realized I'm not in Kansas anymore. (laughs) You get it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I mean... Joseph, look, that a lot of people since that document, you know, Operation Northwoods has come out that has really woke up, you know, woken up a lot of people. Stay woke. Um, it is really because, look, even in, in that year, I think it was 62, 63, they were talking about remote controlling planes. Um, 62, I believe. OK. Yeah, I know it was somewhere well, around the there. Thing. Here's the thing. Kennedy. He, he when, blocked when, it. When, the, when, when, when the, the, the big brass in the Pentagon put this on Kennedy's desk. He couldn't believe that they would want him as a president of the United States of America. Our last president, by the off on this. He said, you people are crazy. Yep. I'm not going to have citizens of the United States of America set up and killed like this. Uh, and then we're going to blame it on, uh, you know, Castro. Yeah, yeah no, no, no doubt. He, 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 he threw it back at him and said, you know, I'm not going to go for this. You know, he blocked it. Look, look, Joseph, we yeah. got to run. That was a great call, man. Great point. I'm glad you brought up Operation Northwoods. You are a treasure trove of treasure trove of information, for sure. Um, we're coming to a break. We we'll get back. We'll get uh, you know, Tory's uh, outlook on that and, and Caleb's as well. And we'll take these other calls. Look, Ballad New Orleans Radio. We're definitely not in Kansas. And I was talking about, you know, the awakening. You first have to admit the government is lying to you. And they don't love you, and they really want to harm you, okay? And, and also, that you, and you have to admit yourself you've been lied to your whole life. Battle New Orleans Radio will be back. You acted like nefarious beasts. I can't follow your holla hoax dollar score, especially when the holla Mador killed a lot more. I highly recommend it. That rhetoric, you should end it. Your anti-Gentile pension has me very offended. Ladies and gentlemen, we have finally figured it out. At first, we thought it was the Eskimos. But now there's a strong consensus amongst experts. It's an entirely different animal. If I had to name a creature to maim and make the world a better one, there isn't a doubt that I would kick out these dirty, filthy leprechauns. They run in your place right into the ground. So many afraid to step to one. If you grow a sack and focus on facts, you'll have to confront the leprechaun. They're pushing their porn and poisonous corn. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Battle New Orleans Radio, right here on 990 AM WGSO. Yeah, I want to get your take, Tori, on what Joseph was talking about, Operation uh, Northwoods. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that document or not, uh, but, you yeah, know, you, go ahead. Uh, I mean, um, that's uh, it's just a, that's a good example of like yeah. the, these tactics. And it's kind of interesting that, like, we look back at something back in Kennedy's day and we say like, Oh, there's a good example. But then some people would say, well, that was way back then though. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly these things are still going on. Um, you know, you know, if they were doing that, they were planning that then, what do you think they've planned for us now? Well, I mean, well, how, how far is our government ran off? And because if, uh, Kennedy was assassinated and, um, who was in control back then, I mean, then, um, so how does, how has that maintained itself to the present? No, absolutely. And you look at Kennedy. Um, he really didn't want Israel to get nuclear weapons. That was a big old deal. He didn't. Um, he wanted to, he wanted to end the Federal Reserve. That was a big deal. Um, he didn't really want to mess with Vietnam. That was a big deal. So, I mean, you look at all those those factors and 
man, it's 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 really scary that they murdered our 35th president right in front of our face. You mm-hmm. know, so, you know, I think they that's when they officially, you know, I granted Kennedy came from an old lineage, bloodline family from the power structure, no doubt. But it was still I still believe, you know, it was the last president. Really, they, they completely hijacked that position 100,000 percent at that point. You know, no doubt. But look, let's take these calls. We have Paul uh, in the West Bank. Then you, Rich, and then you, then you, uh, Vincent. Go ahead, Paul. Hey, Nate. How you doing, I'm, man? I'm and good, bro. How's you guys with it? How y'all doing, guys? Doing pretty good. Okay, I, you? I see you got somebody on the on the program tonight that's from Ohio. What part of Ohio, sir? I'm in Marietta. Okay. On the Ohio uh, River. In 71 to 74, I was eight years in the Air Force, but I spent four years at Old Rockbourne Air Force Base outside of Columbus. Are you familiar with that? Uh, no, I am not, personally. And then it became uh, Rick and Baxter Air Force Base after the uh, Great Ace uh, of World War One. that was from Columbus. Hmm. Yeah. Well, anyways, you, uh, your state got me used to cold weather and snow <laughs> and ice. Uh, what, what I want to say tonight is uh, is that <clears throat> I do believe in weather modification. There was uh, two senators, if we could go back to the 60s on this, and maybe Nate and those these gentlemen. Uh, you had uh, Senator... <clears throat> Nick Beggich uh, Sr., which was from uh, Alaska, huh? Uh, Alaska. Yeah, his son's and great. And also we had uh, Senator Hill Boggs, uh-huh. that was from uh, Louisiana. Yep. And, uh, you know, uh, the plane mysteriously, uh, <laughs> you know, vanished. Yeah, they, they got, they got well stoned. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think, Nathan. I, I don't know, they need to be around the time of uh, Hurricane Betsy or something. Yeah, I, I think uh, so. I mean, know, that was before my time. Uh, that was before my time, but I am a uh, his, his, historian. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a history buff, not a historian. Okay. You know, I'm a history buff. I, I have followed a lot of that. I, I believe so. I'm, I'm about to look it up right now for you. Now, what I want to see real quick is this. Well, Senator Nick Beggage, his son, Nick Beggage Jr., Correct. he wrote, uh, he wrote a, well, he did a lot of investigating with Hart. The program Hawk, yep. the antenna array uh, in Alaska, yep. and uh, he's the one that uh, uh, that wrote this book, uh, An- "The Angels Don't Play This Harp." Yep, that's a good book. And now, not only that, um, he this was in the nineties. This man was talking about this, <laughs> and uh, that's uh, well, it would have been a late nineties or early uh, two thousand two or something like that. But uh, that's when Art Bell was uh, was on coast to coast. Well, he's the one that uh, he, that was his uh, child, you know, because he he made that program. <coughs> but anyways, uh, it was supposed to be for some type of uh, system to help submarines out, some type uh, to take over. Um, in other words. Uh, 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 in other words, a new type of system that would take over for uh, sonar, you know. And uh, but uh, he he always, he did say that uh, he 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 was afraid that this thing would would, would really do something with the weather. Yeah. No. Well, 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 Paul. They have two harp centers, and they do it by heating up the ionosphere, and they can they can they can do all kind of crazy stuff with that. There's two. Well, yeah, you see. You see, I, I called. Uh, I called this guy that's new now. Uh, he's got the paranormal channel yeah. on your station yeah. on Thursday. Look, look, hold that really thought. Is. I want hold hold that thought. I want you to. Fin- I'll give you a minute to finish your point after the break. Look, we have okay. we have our great co-host tonight, Mr. Tory Grossman, Caleb Hit in Ohio. Man, uh, you know these guys are fantastic. Appreciate y'all. We have a couple more calls to get to. And then we'll discuss some uh, some other things as well. We'll come back to you, Paul, after the re- break. Battle New Orleans Radio, right here in the home of the First Amendment. Please support us. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Battle New Orleans Radio. That's my boy, Diesel Automatic. I did a great interview with him a couple of years ago. Go check it out on YouTube, Battle New Orleans Radio YouTube channel. Yeah, dude is a great dude. He lives in Montenegro now. Um, 
Uh, Richie, I see you hung up. Look, call back, man. After Paul, you were next. Call back, Richie. I'd like to get to you. Um, okay. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll give you a minute to finish the finish statement. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be real quick. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, if people think that climate change isn't real, when you get out of your homes in the morning, look up in the sky when you're going to see these grid patterns, okay, where you could almost play tic-tac-toe up there it's so bad. It's God's quilt. For sure. Yes. And tell me that uh, climate control isn't real. And uh, you, you know what? Uh, you have more people dying now from respiratory diseases than ever before. No, no. So you tell me, you know, okay, you know, it is for real. And people better wake up to it. No, that's Thank a great. That's a great point. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, look, aluminum, strontium, barium. They're finding this. They're finding aluminum everywhere. The oxygen levels are are, are very low. Look, before we take this next call, uh, you, Caleb, or you, uh, Tori, you have anything to say about you know what he was discussing? Caleb, you want to go? Well, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, fascinated as far as this uh, weather modification. I know. Uh, Previous caller um, brought up uh, Hurricane Betsy. I know we talked uh, during one of the breaks about that uh, back in 1965. Many people today still believe there were press reports uh, in Florida newspapers at the time uh, during Operation Storm Fury that the government wa- the government was uh, seeding uh, the Hurricane Betsy out while it was still out in the Atlantic Ocean. And then suddenly it obviously plows it through Florida and comes into uh, the New Orleans and the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley area. Uh, people today still question whether that was uh, seeded or not, although I don't think that was ever debunked by the government as far as that goes. But um, at any rate, and then there was um, another deal. Obama actually ordered uh, the Department of Homeland Security. They actually got involved with the hurricane manipulation as well. There was actually a, a document that was put out in uh, 2009. Um, let's see here. It was um, from the, actually, I'm looking at the, the United States Department of Commerce, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They were trying to drum up ways of uh, reviving uh, Operation Storm Fury, which lasted from 1962 to 1983. And they were uh, through the Project HAMP, uh, Hurricane Aerosol and Microphysics Program. And they were obviously, they're acknowledging uh, modification of hurricanes uh, in 2009. So people ought to go ahead and, and check that out as well. Yeah, that's um, a, Yeah, go I'll, ahead, Tor. Okay, I'll say something real quick. Uh, as far as uh, global, global warming, global cooling, uh, I've heard people argue both sides of that and uh you know frankly i don't i don't know um but it it doesn't even it doesn't matter because the direction we need to go is the same uh we need to attune ourselves to nature and see what nature wants to happen through us so i it's it's the direction is always the same and that's what they're uh basically avoiding (laughs) by uh just uh, divide and conquer and uh i mean sure the science has always been able to be manipulated but we need to be tuning into nature. That's and we need to be more ecologically uh, harmonious within our environment. No, no, that's, that's a, it, there's no argument about that, and that's what we need to do. It does, so the rest of it, as, as far because my dad is one way about it, and um, yeah. other people or other say one thing or another. I don't, I really don't know, honestly. It, well, that's the thing; it's manipulated both ways, and I think it's being steered both ways to cover up stuff that's happening on both levels. So, you know, it's very manipulated. But look, let's take, let's go. We're going to Richie next and then to you, Vincent, right after Richie. And then, Phil, go ahead, Richie. Sorry to have you waiting. Go ahead. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to, anybody to chime in on this one. Uh, okay. And there's several aspects to this. Uh, you know, the, the mass of America, much less the, the mass of the world, who are, most of, most of us are controlled through the media, sure. uh, through what we, what we read, what we've been taught, uh, if we do read, uh, what we've been taught, what we listen to, the radio stations, uh, the TV stations we watch, the movies we watch. So uh, I personally 
uh, and this is no uh, slight on the average American. Uh, I call them ignorant in the, in the true definition of the term. They just don't know. They've been uh, brainwashed from the inception, and for whatever reason, that spark, that spirit that's touched you and I and most of the listeners who have uh, awakened us to this, uh, this terrible situation we find ourselves in, I, I'm setting this thing up for you guys. Um, I feel that the mass of humanity is too far gone, and the powers that be have too much control to have this work out to any kind of peaceful or harmonious uh, resolution. And uh, I'd like you guys, uh, if you have the time, do, do you, each of you look at this through secular or spiritual uh, historic lenses uh, to the future uh, of, of, our, of our fate? And uh, I'd like to also touch on some of the themes in the, uh, in the myths that facilitate our control, particularly here in our, in our nation, and that's terms like uh, the consent of the governed, uh, everyone is equal, uh, support the troops, how about that one? Uh, we're a nation of immigrants, diversity is our greatest strength, we fight the good fight, Nathan. You know, we went over there in Europe in World War II to, to free the world from communist tyranny and, and Nazism. Uh, so that's, I know that's a, a mouthful, but uh, if you guys could comment on that. Go, go ahead, uh, Tori. You, 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 you comment, and then Caleb, and then I'll respond. Um, well, uh, I view this all from a spiritual lens, and uh, I, I think that there is hope. Uh, like you know, there's extremely there, there's it's not uh, not foolhardy hope either. There, the, because I'm viewing it from a spiritual lens, I, I know that it's 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 able to be a, uh, uh, it's we're so close to to where we need to go. It's ridiculous. It's just like um, it's almost unbelievable how how simple the solution is. And um, I but let me think about. Um, like well, we, we have to focus on direction. Hang on one second. Hang on one second. Richie he was lagging. He was, it, was, it, was, it was lagging. Go, go ahead, Tor. We have to focus in the in the direction that's going to accomplish the task. And so, in you know, you, I've I've achieved things that are like, I've done things that I thought were impossible, and I self doubted myself the entire time, but I didn't listen to that voice. And because I, I was able to push that voice aside and, and know that I didn't know how it was going to be accomplished, but I knew that it could be, you know, um, and an example, I, I, once I did 700 push-ups without dropping to my knees and I'm not the type of person that I was in, I was an army ranger, but like, I'm not the, the most physically fit type of person. I'm, uh, I'm stubborn as hell though. I'm tenacious. And, and, uh, I was one of two people out of 16 people that, that did 700 without dropping to our knees. And I tell you, every single person that dropped once, their will was shattered, and then they, they fell over and over and over again. But for some reason, I, I was able to push aside this voice that was telling me you can't keep going. And I had five or six, seven different second wins. You know, it was like um, uh, you just keep breaking through barriers. So I know it's possible. I know we're, it's, we're very close to it. Uh, we have... Uh, um, things in place like uh, connecting us on a consciousness level that um, uh, are very hopeful. I, it, I think that uh, you have to come from the place. Are you describing this in a, is this a Christian point of view or some sort of new this age vision you have? This is a spiritual point of view, in, in which case yeah. that there's, uh, there's something unwavering within us. And if we align with that, and that's the truth, and that's what um, I think nature... Um, is telling us um, our own nature too, and like if you align with that, you can pierce through uh, boundaries that previously you couldn't see how to 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 accomplish it. You can see how to to get through that, but if you align with that unwavering part within us, uh, which connects all of us, um, anything is possible. I know that. So you person. you see this? Do you see it's possible that it, we're going to turn into some kind of united colors of Benetton co commercial world where all the races and uh, transgender sexes are going to be holding hands on a mountainside, passing a coke around. It's, I, I, I'm not well, following you. Well, I'm, I, I don't know about that, but we're we're all different. Um, uh, diversity makes for um, uh, a stable exactly. ecosystem. 
The so, ho- let, let him finish, Rich. Let him finish. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, if you have a, if you have all the same types of trees in a forest, so you get a forest fire, you know, there, you, you might not get anything. Like, everything could get wiped out. It, in nature, diversity adds to um, stability. So there's going to be conflict Whoa. always, but that's the nature. I mean, any everything is in vibration in the universe. So if we're going to – conflict is uh, – it's just a part of life, and I think that none of us would want it any other way, frankly. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, mm. go, go ahead, Caleb. You, you want to respond to that? Well, I think obviously people often wonder, you know, what really is the root cause of uh, what, as far as the direction that our world is currently headed in our society. Of course, I know uh, David Abadie used to say that, you know, only only with an informed public can we truly live in a free society. Uh, you know, Christians uh, look to the Bible in Second uh, Chronicles 7.14 says, uh, God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So who knows, maybe as a church we need to get down on our, pr- on our knees more and cry out to God yeah. more often. Yeah. You, you want to respond there, Rich, and then we got to run. Yeah, uh, gee, I didn't really get satisfied by any of that. Uh, if you guys could uh, just comment on the, the other point I brought up about the myths and uh, and fallacies uh, that keep a, people controlled, all of the, you know, we fight the good fight, the, the, the government, the consent of the government, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, all right, I'm going to respond to that, and we got to go to a break. Appreciate your call, okay, Rich. Thank and, you. and then I'm coming to Vincent next, right after the break. Look. I think it starts individually. We cannot do anything as a collective or as a because we're on this. We're all different people, and you know we we've all been brought up in this diverse, multicultural world here in America. That there's really no coming back from at this point here in America. But I say this: that it starts with you. Okay, you can't change the neighborhood unless you're changed. You know, and that starts on a spiritual level. That starts on a health level, a conscience level. Okay, it all starts with you making a decision to change, you know, and pulling yourself out of this New World Order system. You know, and that starts with eating healthy. That starts with praying or meditating or whatever you believe in because we're not all Christians. We're not all Buddhists. We're not all Muslims. We're not all you know, Jews, we're all different people. You're never going to get everybody to the same faith-based religion or, or, or whatever. So it all starts, with, you know, with you mentally, physically, spiritually. It has to, you have to change yourself first. You know, you have to put the glasses on, you know, to use, they live a, a analogy. And until you do that, um, man, you can hang it up. You'll never see anything but the Madison Avenue uh, you know, mainstream narrative and media push New World Order agenda. So that's the only way, in my opinion, is you have to change. It starts with you. And then once it starts with you, then you can work on changing your brother and your sister and informing them. I mean, I, I do. Look, we're all doing a radio show tonight with some very different points of views and perspectives that, frankly, a few years ago, you wouldn't have heard of any heard any of this. So we are moving in the right direction. So look, Battle of New Orleans Radio, we come back, we're coming right to you, Vincent. Battle of New Orleans Radio, right here on 990 AM WGSO, and our good buddy Goyam just came into the studio. Hey, what's up, what's up? What's up, man? Um, on the run, man. Working all day. That's right, buddy. Well, look, I'm going to take these calls real quick, blow through them. Uh, we got Vincent, he's been hanging on the longest, in Kenner. What's up, buddy? Go ahead. How you doing? It's my first time calling in, so... Forgive me if I'm not. No, no problem. Uh, Sorry to have you waiting. Go ahead. Oh, that, that's okay. I, I have told about your program. I just wanted to, you know, tell you in 1965, I was assigned to the 3rd District in New Orleans under Captain Ragusa. He said, Vincent, come in plain clothes tomorrow. I got a special assignment for you. I said, okay, Captain. I came in. He said, go to the airport and pick up this VIP. I did. I'm dropping this guy around doing security for him. And he starts telling me about. Uh, there's a group that's trying to take over the country and the world. Well, I thought the guy was a nut. So I bring him back to the plane. About a week later, I'm in police headquarters drinking a little coffee, and Lieutenant Burris walks in. He was the head of, uh, of um, 
Oh, shoot, I forgot the exact name now. It's been a number of years ago. I'm 71 now. But uh, Intelligence Division. And uh, so I mentioned it to him. He says, yeah, we're aware of it. It was, it was it's the Audit of the Illuminati, Council on Foreign Relations, the Bill the Burgers. I said, well, what are you going to do about it, Lieutenant? He said, what do you want me to do about it, Vincent? I said, let's go arrest him. And he said, okay, what's the charge? And I just looked at him. He said, you see, Vincent, they're doing it legally. They're doing it politically. Well, I've been watching this thing all these years, and guess what? They got us, okay? They got control of our government. Now, I'm on a Republican executive committee. I've been on it 30 years, all right? We didn't want, I wanted them, but we didn't want Trump in because he's uncontrollable. Someone just mentioned Second Corinthians 7.14. If my people will call on my name, will we'll pray I'll hear from heaven and, and heal their land. I am hoping that God has sent Trump to heal our land. Uh- that's all we hope here. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Hey, Vincent, and, and I hear what you're saying, and we had high hope as well. But he's signed an executive executive orders now, right? About um, I mean, all kinds cracking of... down on the playing this good cop, bad cop stuff. Well, we got to crack down on what happened in Charlottesville and and all this free speech stuff. Shows like ours that question things. Well, we're going to fall under that veil, even though we might have nothing to do with Charlottesville or, or the white supremacy or anything like that. You question anything now, you're going to. So to me, Trump signed and pushing his finger. He could have executive ordered stopping all these uh, monuments coming down, right? But he did, has not. So what the, what, what makes you think he's not he co-opted? Well, we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, well, I mean, the problem is, it. see, the problem is, say, the case in New Orleans with the monuments. We've got to wait and see to see what Mitch does. We've got to wait and see if they're going to take the. We've got to wait and see to find out if the NOFD was involved, if taxpayer dollars. Guess what? It's all happened. It's all happened in the middle of the night. In front of our face. We saw it. We were there. We saw it. We saw, uh, you know, people snipers up in our uh, rooftops. We saw it. We saw the Gestapo-like tactics. We saw it with our own eyes. And now it's all gone. And a couple people like Dr. Marksbury last week trying to fight to get him back, he's being red flagged too. And they're coming after anybody, as you see with Trump's executive order here, that, you know, is is going is mouthing off about it. We, we, we've been in, – in, in real quick, Vincent, we've been – we've just uh, – you know, Goyim and I, we've been infiltrated by FBI. Or FBI forces, uh, we, we, we've had people trying to do all kind of stuff to get us thrown off the air uh, behind the scenes uh, b- by using dirty tricks against us uh, j- just as of late. I know. That- I, I drove down here so that Nathan doesn't walk out of the studio by himself. Put it to you like that. Thank you. They, they threw me in jail, set me up, and threw me in jail. So I've been visited several times by the FBI, too. Uh, and, but, and, I, and I'm, re- I'm, part of home, uh, what, I'm retired from the governor's office of Homeland Security. And I knew some of the things they were doing when I tried to do something about it. They set me up, threw me in jail. But there is a God. I, I agree. Out to God. No, no. I cried out to God, and he answered me verbally. And he said, I will, I will, I will deliver you. You're talking to the only guy in the country that has a federal expungement. Jim Garrison and I were good drinking buddies. He tried to investigate who killed our president. Look what they did to him. That's well, listen, look, we're coming up. We're coming to a break here. We appreciate that call. Thank, listen next week, Vincent. Yeah. We got Garrett, we got Gary King coming back on. Uh, yeah. We come back. Go ahead. Appreciate you, Vincent. We're coming to a call. coming to a hard break. We'll be right back. Battle of New Orleans Radio. All right, Battle of New Orleans Radio. Look, listen. We're getting uh, vulnerable with the listeners here. Our hundreds of listeners. Hopefully, you know we hope we. Well, say we that. do. We do get seven hundred downloads on the podcast when we, we upload it to Podbean, and we do get thousands of uh, views on the aggregate on YouTube altogether. So and, I mean, we got a few thousand listeners. And a week. Look, we're going to clarify our situation in the coming weeks on our future with the radio show and WGSO and our show because you know we were talking. We've been talking about this a lot, me and Nathan. You know, like we've had people come into studio, random people that are not affiliated with the producer. They're not affiliated with Jeff Craig. They're not affiliated with Rudy. The produ- you know, these are the names of the people at WGSO, and I hope they're listening because it's important for them to know that we've had random people show up, and as we're starting the show, they're around. They're walking around. They're turning knobs back there behind the glass, and it's like, who are these people? And it wasn't an engineer either. And we, we confronted the WGSO brass, and they disappeared. Now, you know, we have other entities that are emailing and trying to shut our show down. And, uh, you they, know, we they, have families, we have businesses. They're that unveiling run. as agents as well. Exactly. We, we've been infiltrated. We're, we're basically disassociating ourselves from anybody who we do not know for six months or longer now. It's legal. We have legal representation now for this. 
So, um, you know, we've getting, been getting a lot of advice from other people who have been doxxed. So good news for us is, one, we're not scared. Number two. Go- going at Cameron Cruz. They had the news show up to his house, show his front of his house, tell him what town he lived in, showed his front door. Uh, uh, parents' house. I mean, they, they – I mean, that, Listen, this just shows the li- – the listeners have to realize, though, if you try to speak the truth, obviously we're on to something, number one. You poked the bear, I man. I'm the- on the right show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're obviously on – on to something if we're you know because if we're just talking about well let's walter go. isaacson where you at buddy? Yeah, we got to go get those muslims over there in the cave we got to do that if you say that you can say that all day long we talk Turn about in the that. glass yeah exactly you know we're gonna make the sand glow so but um, back to what we've experienced you know we've experienced this we you know we run our own businesses so look you can dox us all you want we ain't going anywhere our clients know what we do and what we're about, we talk about this stuff every day to everybody we talk to. So everyone from the gas station to our you know, coworkers to you name it. So and to our wives, they get our sick wives, of it. yeah, you name it. So that's the situation moving forward. We're going to keep you guys posted on our future of our show, but uh, you know, just to let you guys know what we'll never stop doing this. Yeah. So you know, anyways, look, we're going to go to the calls. We got Gary King. Go ahead, Gary. Hey, fellas, you are the bravest pair of. Radio host in the city, hands down, and it's embarrassing what we have besides you guys. Appreciate it, and, Gary. Um, we love you. You are definitely... Um, hey, hey, Gary, Gary, I, I Gary. Say, uh, Gary we, more dangerous. Yeah, we, go ahead. We look up to you, man. You you were the, the, the forefather in this, brother. Well, I've been at a long time, but also you need to learn when to stick and move. And I think you guys are uh, over the target right now. Um, Walter Isaacson, uh, I hope you're listening. Hey, I, I, I heard... No, Hey, Gary, I heard you call in to WWL uh, and talk to uh, the sheriff, man, and call him out about 9-11. That was great, man. I, people are listening, and that's a big station that, t- you know, if you try to mouth off like that, they cut you off. Yeah, 37 states WWL's in. Yeah, you did a good job yeah. sticking and moving because you were like, look, you're a great guy. I want to be your first caller. So that was great, and and that kind of station does not allow that kind of question. So that was pretty impressive. So go ahead, Gary. Well, I have to. The, uh, the, the, uh, caller lady, uh, she seemed like a young person. I told her, but believe it or not, to be the first caller on his show, I was in Bay St. Louis. I drove all the way back. I did a full band practice and then I drove out to Elmwood. And then finally I got on the show, but I'm going to tell you right now, the first thing that went on the screen, because they have to tell Newell Norman, what's coming, and what was on the screen was, do you two gentlemen believe the official story of 9-11? So they saw that right away. And that, that stayed on the screen for two and a half hours as Newell Norman uh, brought in the special agent in charge of uh, Chicago, agency after agency. So um, I, I'm highly suspicious of Newell Norman. Uh, uh, I think he's the Department of Homeland Security uh, whore. I'm gonna say it now. Oh, that's right. I can't say that now. I got never mind. Yeah, yeah. You didn't. Well, we got the uh, seven second button, but no. When you said that he's gonna usher in the police state in New Orleans, uh, it just bang bells just went off in my head. He um, basically saying that thanks to 9/11, we all feel so much safer now. With these uh, billion-dollar agencies running amok and all the, um, I guess, military equipment going to all the... In other words, Newell Norman is the recipient of the big fraud that is 9-11. Absolutely. You, you know how much money they've gotten, all the Fusion Center money. that, that He's just bathing in the security state. And, and, and so, you know, I used to laugh at... Um, what was it? The um, uh, Garland Robinette. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he's. I'm going to say this now. Him. We're going to beg for the day that we get Bar- Garland Robinette, who's just not aware of what's all going on. Let me tell you what. Newell Norman knows exactly what's going on, and the and the guests that he had were just praising all of the uh, alphabet soup agencies, and and what a great, fantastic job they were doing and uh, keeping. I uh, say from, uh, you know, the whole story. Well, so, Ga- Gary, I, 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 G- Gary, let me say something. And I, I, I asked the listeners who call into our show to do what Gary did, call up these bigger stations because they are bigger than WGSO, let's be honest, and not just call up Jeff Carrera or our show. Call up these bigger stations, wait the 30, 40 minutes, whatever it takes, even give them a different topic. And then when you get on the air, 
ask them some real questions and see how they respond. They're going to cut They're you gonna off. They're going to cut you oh, off. We just lost Goy. I'm so uh, bad. Yeah, so right. Exactly. Use fake names. Call up and question these things and see how they respond. You'll see. You don't have to be a DJ, a radio DJ, a host or anything like we are. We're just regular street folks who did this. But you can see for yourself how you're going to get censored. So go ahead and try it. You know, and it's a lot cheaper than what we paid at WGSO. So. Yeah, it doesn't take much to get shut off. So I just gave them a, a straight up question, and the an- I knew the answer before because the the more I listened to the show, I knew exactly what was going on. And his answer was, "Well, you know, the official story. Of course, we didn't. It was such a huge event that we didn't really know everything that was going on at the time. So of course, mistakes were made. So by the time the nine eleven commission report came out, sure, there was a few." Um, irregularities or something like that. Yeah. So after I heard that, that's all I need to know. I mean, I'm going to just be honest with you. I've studied 9-11. I should have a doctorate degree in it. I hope Dr. Fetzer write his book. You know, so I know what's going on when it comes to 9-11. And Newell Norman is, um, like like you said, he's, um, he's going to usher in the police state and make us beg for more and more Security. Well, people, like Gary, the monuments. Gary, people mm-hmm. are begging for that security right yeah. now. You yeah. see it on on Facebook. You see you see the average, yeah. as Richie would say, you know, the average white cuck who's going to see these mm-hmm. monuments go down in the protests. Like, what well, man? These Antifa. Oh, uh, we got to do something yeah. about this. We need to bring the National Guard in. Yeah. Let, let, uh-huh. let, let's get Tori's take on this. Go ahead, Tori. What, what's your take on what uh, Mr. Gary King is talking about? Um, I'm, well, I, of course, 9-11, of course, it's an inside job, or of course, the official story is bogus. It just building number seven alone is enough to, to, to throw that. How in, about the uh, passports? Those passports fell right out oh, that yeah, burning plane. And it, on the what's that? Yeah, what's those passports made day. out of? Th- that one and yeah. Tower 7, Tori, that, that, and those six. two are. Yeah. And 6. And wow. 6. Yeah. Don't forget about building 6. That's right. There he, was more than just um, one building go. And there was three. There were actually um, another building besides that. So if you, it was, it had to be a World Trade Center, which we know. Or since Clay Shaw was running the, the trademark, you know, the World Trade Center here in New Orleans, we know that's high level intelligence places. And if you had a big fat con uh, insurance policy, then that's the only buildings that got bombed in yeah, New York. No doubt. What, what you got on that tour? Go ahead. I think we need to go beyond the. Uh, that it, 9/11 was an inside job. Uh, it's too 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 much times passed. We need to start building a picture of, uh, you know, all right. Well, to, to what purposes was it carried out? Who's benefiting from it? Uh, clearly not the, the Muslim Ooh. nations. Oh, he's bringing he's bringing he's bringing up the nation you can't talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and you, Newell you know, Norman down to the local level, he's benefited like a madman from all this. So, yeah, go ahead, Tor. So Sorry to cut the, you off. The thing is, it's like people the people that don't want to. Um, uh, admit it or don't want to do their own thinking and uh, because they're just waiting for the news to say it. Like, What they need is for somebody to be able to explain it to them in a way that it, it makes sense and that um, so they don't have to do like really any work. So what we need to be doing is building this uh, a coherent picture of uh, the power structure that's in place that that is benefiting from it. Just build a court case on it. And um, I mean, it's all right in plain sight. So we kind of have to get over the fact that uh, it was an inside job. We, um, I want to, I want to know more about what our relationship to Israel is. Hmm. Um, in and, uh, yep. and I want to know more about what our relationship to Saudi Arabia is and uh, to, uh, to Europe. And um, yeah. we, that's, that's yeah, important. Let me just say this. The United States is a province of Israel. It's as simple as that. Um, the dual, what I think it's the air pack, APEC, um, American Israeli yeah. Public Affairs Committee. That's right. And if you don't sign the uh, oath of allegiance, there's, a, there's only one person in Congress. His last name is Jones, Walter Jones, I believe. Yeah. He is the only Congressperson in the entire Congress that we have that have not signed the oath of allegiance to Israel. To basically any uh, legislation that comes their way, Israel has to come first, and and everyone has signed it down to us. Steve Scalise, oh, everyone, you just named the congressperson. If their name's not, I think it's Walter Jones. It and is. they signed it. What's going to happen to him? Then, he can come hide out with us. Yeah, well, they tried uh, to get rid of him, but somehow he just went ahead and got elected. And then if you want to come 
to the dual citizenship issue, you know, if you want me to roll off a few names, I can do that. Uh, well, uh, let, dual citizen. Let, let Tori respond, and then you can do it. He was about to say something. Go ahead, Tori. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. I, what I was going to say is that, um, you know, there's there's two sides to every coin, and uh, we've we've just we know like uh, very intimately the one side of the coin, and uh, it's very incomplete. It's a very incomplete picture. We what we need to be doing is trying to see things from other people's perspective. Uh, for me, that's like, well, what did the Afghanis think about this? What did the Iraqis think about this? Like, what does it look like from the outside looking in? And then you be, kind of begin to see that, uh, of, co- of course, they think it was Israel. Um, of, co- of, of course, uh, they, like, have this different picture of it. And it, neither is completely right. And we have to be able to see things from other people's angle and understand so that we can come together and reconcile. No, no, because no. I don't, I don't want to... Um, accuse anybody of anything and i don't know the full picture no, no doubt. i want like, reconciliation no, is what we need to do no doubt. gary roll off the names real quick and then we got to go to break and right. then, go ahead okay, 30 seconds the, uh, 30 seconds okay 112 congress um let, let me just name the states um well richard uh blumenthal barbara boxer benjamin cardin diane feinstein al franken um uh, herb k-o-h-l uh, Latinburg, Frank, uh, New Jersey, Lieberman, Levin, Bear, uh, Bernard Sanders. Are, uh, All right, are keep tr- reading them off. Human. We're going to break. Keep reading them off. You'll probably still be going when we get back. Battle of New Orleans Radio. Right, that was just a sentence. That was just a sentence. All right, All right then, thank um, you. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be right back. Hold on, Gary. Oh. Okay. Battle of New Orleans Radio. We are back. Nathan, go ahead, man. Yeah, Final yeah. segment. Is Gary King still in there? Yeah, I'm still uh, there. All right. R- r- rattle off that last couple of names, 30 seconds, and then I want to give, I promise, Tori, time to talk about right, holistic yeah. healing. I was supposed to give him 30 minutes, and just the way the show okay, went, it just now, didn't happen. I, I apologize, Tori. All right. So these are not the people who have signed the oath to Israel. These are actual dual citizens of Israel and the United States. Gary Ackerman, New York. Shelley Berkeley, um, Nevada, Howard Berman, California, Eric Cantor, Virginia, uh, Theoline, Rhode Island, Stephen Cohen, uh, Tennessee, Susan Davis, California, Ted Dewitch, uh, Florida, Elliot Engel, New York. And hey, what about Walt Bob Isaacson? Wiener. Well, he's not a congressperson. This is just our I, Congress. Hey, you know he's a dual citizen, too, though. Go, go ahead. I'm right. sorry. Henry yeah. Waxman, California, Anthony Wiener, New York, um, yeah. John Yer- Hey, hey Gary, Gary we get Israel. Gary, yeah, no doubt. Look, we can go on forever about this. Look, the whole segment. Yeah, but look, I, Caleb I, knows him too. Yeah, I, I want to give I want to give Tori some time. It was supposed to get longer, and I apologize to to discuss some holistic healing and really what we can do. You got five minutes, Tori, and I apologize. It's so short on this subject, but you see okay. how the shows went. I apologize. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, basically. Um, uh, I was an Army Ranger. I've been on four deployments and uh, going over there and doing that stuff. And uh, I was on the show a couple weeks ago and talking Great about uh, Pat, Tillman, Pat, Pat Tillman's assassination. Um, so th- I've had a number of things that awoke me to the situation, 9-11. Uh, my platoon sergeant rescued Marcus Luttrell, and I just happened to be reading Lone Survivor when I joined the military. And he told me it was all uh, um, for financial benefit or um, he basically uh, very much spoke against Marcus Luttrell, and I, I can't put words in his mouth. But um, uh, it, I, turned, I found out that it was it was basically a fraud, or not what I thought it was. Um, so I had this awakening, and um, I realized that I like, you know, I I need to be doing get myself right, and in my kind of uh, path of trying to heal, get some sort of you know healing, um, I, I realized that the. Uh, the um, uh, what is right for an individual truly um, it applies metaphorically to our collective body. What what we need to what we need to be doing. So I realized that uh, like the evil that's going on overseas, um, which I was a part of, it, I feel like is only able to be carried out through uh, through ignorance. Uh, that was a big realization for me. That the only reason that this stuff is able to be carrying carried out is that it's flowing in vast tracks of ignorance. And it gets to a point where I'd say that it gets to a point when it's evil, when it turns into willful ignorance. 
Um, so like, because I wonder, how is this able to be carried out? How is this stuff to be? I'm working for the mob. And how is this able to be uh, taking place? Because our society supports it. And, you know, it's just perpetuation of ignorance. So I, I don't think that, like, we would be doing the things we're doing if we were aware of ourselves collectively. So in that, like, for my own personal health, I, ha I began to tap into my own, my own uh, sense of health in a mind, body, soul sort of way. Because um, I couldn't, I needed to like put the spiritual health in place. Uh, otherwise, it would it would feel incomplete. And um, I started gardening um, as a form of therapy. I, I lived in a tent in Hawaii for a year and a half, and um, so I started eating healthy. I started uh, researching this like uh, GMOs and uh, uh, kind of the toxicity in our environment. And I tried to really detox myself. And like in doing that, I realized that. Um, you know, we're a collective organism on the planet. We're one body collectively. And um, if we were able to grow towards our most holistic sense, we would, if, if everybody was able to, to recognize that for themselves individually, we could, we could turn that around and grow collectively towards our most holistic sense. And that was a really big realization for me. Um, and it's basically like acupuncture. So like another thing that I was doing for to help with PTSD is uh, acupuncture because uh, I refuse to take the pharmaceuticals because I, I see a clear uh, conflict of interest between the pharmaceutical industry and the 90% uh, of the world's opium being produced in Afghanistan. And they don't talk about that. They, well, I'm not allowed to really bring that up in the VA. They don't, they don't want to hear about stuff like that. But to me, going in there, I like there's a direct conflict of interest with them they're trying to push psychotropic drugs on me and uh and here we're we're this is the biggest uh opium fields fields in the world um no i'm not going to take these drugs that numb my soul i'm going to try to connect with myself and a mind body soul sort of way um and uh you know we're all we all have the capability to connect ourselves to a deeper um energetic body that because we're we're one organism on this planet that is the truth and if we were, if we each try to do like bring forth what we can so that we can grow more holistically, I feel like we could achieve something that before seemed impossible. And, and, and like, that's what I'm trying to do by coming and, on and start talking about this. Tori, yeah. look, we got about 30 seconds left. Look, how do we balance the stress of life? I've been where I work all day. I got a beer gut and, and yet I want to do those things. And then I have a little baby and whatnot. It's like, how do we balance this? This is a question we'll try to answer next time we have Tori on. And uh, what, anything else you have to say, Nathan? No. Thanks I, to our guests, Caleb and Tori. No, we, you can come back on. We, we don't have nothing lined up next week. Come back on You're next week. To come back on. You yep. want to come back on next week, Tori? We could we could uh, finish this conversation. Well, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd, well, I'd we, be happy to. Yeah, we got some big announcements coming up in, in the future of the show. So look, we're going to be back next week. Battle New Orleans Radio. We'll be back. Thanks, next Caleb. Wednesday. All right, thank you guys.